Ariadne Elder is the princess of the Duchy of Elder. She had a minor role as a girl who will die before the novel begins. But she tried to change something. So it all started when the nanny came into the room and told the little girl, who was looking out the window, that it was time for them to go. She obediently turned around, but she had only one thought in her mind. She wanted to change her fate and knew that she had to survive. Arya walked holding the woman's hand and realized that she had only one chance and she would grab it tightly. Finally, they came to a room with a door slightly open. The young man assured the old man that they had loved each other, but that she had died not because of him, but because of the defiled ground. Listening to the Duke's defense, he did not believe his words and said that he was talking nonsense because an elementalist could not die when he was near the defiled ground. Besides, the elder had to stop her. But the man claimed that her body was too weak to fight the evil and he was shocked by it. The Duke explained that she said she wanted to leave and asked why he did not trust her abilities. However, he could never have imagined that things would turn out this way, so he is in despair. Even though the nanny hurried to close the door, the girl heard the conversation and asked what her father was talking about and if it was about her mother. But she took her hand firmly by the arm and assured her that it was not worth her attention. So she suggested that she wait a little while until they had finished talking. Solan Garcia is one of the most recognized wizards of all time. Her maternal grandfather was a wizard who was named Grand Archmage. He was very unhappy when her mother became pregnant. He cut all ties with them as if they had never existed. But when he heard about her death, he came to visit the Duchy of Elder. The girl knew that, as expected, he would still suspect her father of her mother's death. Suddenly, she remembered her mother running into her room in alarm and calling out her name. Arya then asked her why she didn't have to study anymore because her father had said she had to. But she looked at the bruises on her arms and explained that it wasn't studying. She promised that she would make sure she never had to go through something like that again. She was very sorry for what had happened. But after a while, mom disappeared. When she asked her dad where she was, he said she had gone on a trip. And he promised that if she did well in school, he would tell her more news about her mother. Arya was very happy with his promises and naively believed that everything would be fine. That's why she assured herself that she would be able to overcome everything with dignity. Suddenly, the conversation brought up Arya, and the father suggested that the archmage meet his granddaughter, since she had already come all this way. So the girl was invited inside. Two. Finally, the nanny instructed the girl to control her words and actions because she would be in front of a guest. So finally, it all began. They stood opposite each other, and the father shamed the grandfather, emphasizing that he did not even know her name. But Solon said he did. But her father continued and emphasized that she was Ariadne Elder and would be turning seven this year. The father told her to greet her grandfather, and the girl took her dress in her hands and curtsied. But Solon did not recognize her as his mother at all. He would have believed the Duke if he had said that she had been born of another woman. So he said that he had seen the girl and that was enough for him. But Arya was surprised to hear this. In the original novel, in this scene, she was frightened and threw herself into the Duke's arms. Young children can recognize the sympathy of adults right away. Arya believed that her grandfather, the great archmage, had a clear hatred for her. But even so, it would be wrong to avoid it. The girl knew the plot of the story. Therefore, she clutched her grandfather's clothes with her hands and confidently asked him to take her with him. After all, being with a great archmage who hates her is much better than being with her father. The girl was desperate. Being anywhere was better than being here. She couldn't tell him the reason while her father was around. She did not expect him to take her away so easily, uh, but she knew she couldn't be too suspicious. But her father would stop her and tell her that he had warned her not to play such jokes in front of the guests. And when Arya was desperate, her grandfather suddenly asked her if she wanted to visit the house where her mother grew up. The girl was very excited and said that she really wanted to go there and she was very eager to go. So Solon patted her head and looked into her shining eyes and said that it seemed he had no choice. But the Duke objected that it was too dangerous because Arya was very much like her mother and had the same weak body. Nevertheless, the Archmage assured him that he would accompany her and asked if he had forgotten who he was. In all the years he had raised Gloria, everything had been fine, so the elder should not worry. He added that as a grandfather, he should listen to his granddaughter who is interested in her mother's family. And when his father accused him of never visiting her and now wanting to play grandfather, he said that he couldn't do it before, so he should start now. Solan said that he could pick her up later, but the father was furious that he would not stay away if he wanted to take her. He said that if he went ahead, he would have no choice but to use force. But the grandfather just looked at him angrily and asked him if he had just said that he would take her by force to him, a man who had been given the title of Great Archimagus. And he added that if he really thought he was stealing his child, why didn't he go to the palace and whine about it? He also asked how the king would react to this. Then he took the little girl by the hand 
and despite the Duke's cries, led her away. Arya was riding in the carriage and could not believe that she had really escaped from that hell. The girl noticed that this plan was successful only because she attracted attention. Suddenly, her grandfather asked her to tell him the reason why she had done it, but she was puzzled because she thought he wouldn't even look at her. Solon asked what had scared her so much, but all she could think of was that the story had described it exactly the same way. Meanwhile, Grandpa continued to ask if things were so bad that she had to cling to a man she had never met before. But the girl was confused. She did not understand why he was being so friendly to her. And even when he assured her that everything was fine now and she could talk, Arya was surprised because she was not supposed to cry. She realized that she needed to explain everything and convince him, so she told herself that she needed to be ready to talk to him. But no matter how hard she tried to stop herself from crying, tears kept coming out of her eyes. The grandfather felt sorry for the girl, so he held her close and assured her that if she wanted to cry, she could do so. He could not understand what had happened to make such a small child struggle so much. Princess Ariadne of the Duchy of Elder. Although she had amazing elementalist abilities, she was not destined to develop them. Her life was interrupted at the age of 16. She learned of the fate that awaited her in the year she was to turn seven. The girl recalled sitting on a chair, clenching her fists and unable to raise her head from the terror and excitement. Her father then assured her that everything would be fine because he would never do anything that would be dangerous for her. The Duke said that her father loved her too much to do such a thing, but he never paid attention when she asked him to stop because she was hurt. And when the bottle her father was holding fell down, she was immersed in something unknown. Arya knew who she was, but her mind was filled with someone else's memories. Science, not magic, machines instead of elementalists. She lived in another place that was radically different from this world. Over time, she fell deeper and deeper. She realized that these 28 years were memories from her past life. Suddenly, she found herself in a library. There were books that she had read in her past life. Fairy tales, poetry collections, detective stories, and historical events. All the other books had hard covers except this one. This is one of the ten parts of the story. The girl read it and could not believe her eyes. It was all about her, about Ariadne Elder. The story that mentioned her name was one of the stories she had read in her past life. In this story, the main character, Axel Valentine, had the ability to be reborn, with the help of which he tries to save his world, which is on the verge of destruction due to an invasion. However, despite all the efforts of the protagonist, the world was destroyed. In this story, which ended so unsuccessfully, Ariadne appeared only for a short time. Same name, same world. She had no choice but to recognize it. She is the Ariadne Elder of the novel. From the book, she learned that Duke Franz Elder had two children. His own daughter, Ariadne, who died at the age of 16, and his adopted daughter, Helen Elder. Helen became famous as a brilliant elementalist, but these abilities were not given to her by birth. She was able to acquire them through the efforts of the Duke. Arya learned that her father's intervention helped her become him with the help of a special object. The novel did not mention the cause of Ariadne's death and why she died at such an early age, but it was too obvious. It was what her father had done to her. She realized that it was abnormal and disgusting. The girl was horrified and could not believe that he could do such a thing to his own daughter while saying that he loved her. And suddenly she realized that he must have killed her mother. And then she promised herself that if this was true, she would destroy him with her own hands. And now she must survive and find out the truth in order to change the ending of this novel. Meanwhile, the grandfather hugged the frightened girl with his warm hands and calmed her down. He told the coachman to hurry. Finally, they arrived at a magnificent palace. There, while they were going over last year's reports, they saw the Archimagus's carriage through the window. The butler noticed that he had returned earlier than planned. The Marquis noted that Gloria's death had already been investigated, but Salon did not seem to be convinced. But he added that the Archmage seemed to have brought a guest with him. He called his butler over and told him that his niece, the Princess Eldier of the Duchy of Eldier, was about to faint. The butler was dumbfounded. He could not believe that the Marquis had a niece. Ernest did not understand how his father had brought her here and why the Duke had not come with her, his only successor. He was at a loss to understand how this could happen if they both had to be separated and suffer. The butler wondered at the Marquis's irritable behavior and thought that his mental health must have begun to deteriorate. Meanwhile, the girl opened her eyes and couldn't figure out where she was because she had never seen a ceiling like that before. She thought that maybe she had fallen asleep while crying. But for how long? Suddenly the nurse came into the room and was happy to see that the little lady had finally woken up. But instead of getting out of bed, the little girl fell back into bed and the nanny was very frightened. She brought her to her senses and told her that she should not get up so suddenly. Later, she asked if Aria was cold and offered to light the fireplace. She also added that she would be in trouble if she caught a cold. 
The girl was about to say something, but the nanny smiled and preempted her by asking what she wanted. Arya froze, however, because she couldn't remember seeing such a smiling face for a long time. No one in the duchy would even look her in the eye. So finally, she decided to ask her name, and she answered for Miss Ariadne that she was Lucy. The girl smiled. Is there really someone who calls her name with a smile and she was so happy to meet such a person? Then the nurse told her that Arya had been unconscious for three days, so she was happy to see the lady awake and smiling. However, she wondered how she could have slept so long. Suddenly, there was a crash, and the Marquis burst into the room, almost knocking the doctor down. The latter said that he had to examine the girl first, and that he should be the first to go. So he agreed. The doctor approached the girl and asked if he could examine her, if she didn't mind. But suddenly, Arya remembered that a man dressed in the same way had come to the house before, and he would tell her father that she was fully recovered, and then he would say that they could start all over again. After that, her studies always resumed. So she grabbed Mrs. Sleeve and said she didn't want to. But the nurse explained that it was just the doctor. Even though she said he was there to make sure she was well, Arya held onto his sleeve and wouldn't let him come near her. She remembered that as soon as she got better, the experiments always resumed. However, the doctor introduced himself as Jalen Brown and as the Weaver family doctor. Finally, the girl realized that she was in Weaver Castle. So she calmed down and told him her name as well. The doctor said it was an honor to meet her and offered to examine her again. Arya asked how long she had been in bed. Jalen replied that it had been a little over 10 days. He emphasized that she should not overwork herself in the near future because she needed to gain strength. But it was strange to Arya that she had stayed in bed for so long. She didn't understand why she was so weak after leaving the elder. Finally, she thought that no matter how magical she was, she could not be an inconvenience. So she held out her left hand. The doctor was surprised and asked her if she was right-handed, and she said yes. After examining her, he told the Marquis that the girl had run away as soon as she saw him. But Ernest said he had seen it and assumed it was because she felt weak. Then the doctor said that Gloria also hated doctors when she was little. It was not because she was afraid of treatment, nor was it because she was shy. He noticed that Arya was different from everyone else and seemed to have many other injuries. The Marquis, frowning, did not believe the doctor's words. He didn't understand what kind of injuries they could be talking about. Jalen told him that the girl was right-handed, but during the examination, she held out her left hand. This means that she did not want the doctor to see her right hand. He asked if the doctor had noticed anything strange when the young lady arrived, for example, the wounds on her right hand, and he suggested that perhaps she had been taught to hide these injuries. But Ernest could not believe that she could have been told to keep quiet. Who would do that to an elder princess? But to Jalen, it was obvious. How else could these wounds have been concealed, if not by order of the duke? It was as if Arya's body had been broken over and over again, even though the wounds were only on her arm. He added that he could not even imagine how this little girl could endure so much pain. There is no excuse for this. Even the word abuse does not do justice to what she went through. She was tortured. The doctor did not think that things would be so bad in Gloria's marriage to Duke Elder. The Elder family was the richest in the empire, and the Duke did not seem like a bad man. It was said everywhere that he adored his wife and daughter. Everyone thought they were happy, but it turned out to be a lie. With a heavy heart, Ernest knocked on the girl's door and asked Lucy to come out for a while. Arya watched the nanny leave and remembered that the doctor had called him the Marquis, so he must be her uncle. At first, she thought he was angry. Of course, she assumed that he would not be happy to see her. When her mom got pregnant, she almost gave up on the family. So Arya got herself together and said she was glad to see him, the Marquis of Weaver, because she had heard that he was her uncle. And she apologized for disturbing him unannounced and inconveniencing him. She added that she would not forget to return the favor by hosting an intruder as well. However, her uncle remarked that she sounded like an adult, even though she was so young. The girl was afraid that she might look too bold, and he might send her back to Elder because she had upset him. But the uncle sat down next to her and asked her what she was apologizing for. If anyone should apologize, it should be him. The Marquis said that he had only just realized how difficult it had been for her, and he apologized for finding out so late that he couldn't save her earlier. Ernest emphasized that she didn't have to worry about anything else, that her uncle would be able to protect her now. However, the girl did not believe that everything would be all right now because she had not said anything. So she asked the Marquis how he was addressing him as Sir. He told her that she could call him Uncle, but that Sir was fine if she was uncomfortable. He explained that this was her room now. She could stay here as long as she wanted. The girl was surprised that this could be true. Meanwhile, the Marquis was upset because he thought something was missing. She was being prepared in a hurry. Arya replied that everything was enough for her and it was even too much for her. 
So Ernest asked if this room could be compared to the one she had in the Elder Castle. However, the girl pointed out that her old room did not even have a window and was much smaller than this one. Finally, the Marquis realized that the clothes Ariadne had come in were also just a masquerade. He wondered how anyone could live in a room without windows. He was angry that she was not only not treated like a princess, but was also being abused. The Duke was just playing the doting father in public. He was a scoundrel. Suddenly, the girl felt cold and assumed that the Marquis was a knight with elementalist powers. The elements must be raging in his body, and the effect is spreading to the environment. She looked into his face and remarked that she hadn't given much thought to his power of the elements in the novel, but when she saw it with her own eyes, it was definitely no joke. She was not at all clear why this was happening. Perhaps she had said something wrong. If the power is released into the environment, it could mean that the magician is upset about something and is losing control. The Marquis realized that Arya could feel his power, so he said he was very glad she liked the room and covered her with a warm blanket. He told her to rest now and take care of her health. But the girl called out to her uncle again and asked him if he had anything she wanted to ask him. Ernest just smiled and said that there was no need to bring up the past, because she could tell him everything when she felt like it. Arya was shocked. Why was everything so simple? The Grand Archmage and the Marquis in the novel are completely different. She thought that it might be because they were family, because of their bloodline. Or perhaps they sympathize with her and family has nothing to do with it. Family sympathy is just an illusion. The idea that you will be loved just because you are family is a false belief. Arya knew that there was no difference between the past and the present, which meant that she could not rely on their sympathy to keep her alive. The Duke will never let her go. According to the story, there is an elixir that can cleanse the filth. It is called Glamis, and it gives people the power of elementalists. But it cannot be made without her. Only with her help can the Duke fulfill his ambitions. Only if the Archmage and the Marquis oppose her father will he have no choice but to give her up. However, she decided not to rely on their sympathy. Arya thought that when people lose their minds, their sympathy and compassion are the first to disappear. Conscience has some value, but compassion can be easily discarded. Finally, lost in her thoughts, she fell asleep, convincing herself that she must prove herself useful to them at all costs. And she dreamed that she was back in the library. The girl had been waiting for her there for a long time and was happy to see her. She asked Arya if she was in pain, if it was difficult, if it was hard, or if there would be another experiment today. The girl smiled at Reed, the spirit of the library, and told her that she had not come here today because of pain, and she was very happy about that. She guessed that Reed had been created with the library, for she could read but not speak. Her speech had gotten better since she started reading books, but she could not yet say a complete sentence, only single words. Arya was going to give her a name that would suit her, but it didn't work out as planned. It was very hard for her because her body was always in pain after her father's experiments. However, her consciousness was able to stay with Rhi in that library. That's how she was able to survive. Arya asked Rhi if she was taking care of the things she had entrusted to her. The spirit asked if she needed the shiny yellow, the dark red, the safe. After the girl said yes, Rhea found two containers of liquid for her. When Duke Elder was away, Arya would bring things here. She thanked Rai for keeping everything safe. After all, whenever she needed to, she would go from the real world to this library. Morning came. Arya woke Lucy up and was glad that she could go down to have lunch with the Marquis. But she noticed that things were quite old, as there hadn't been a young lady in their castle for a long time. When Lucy saw the girl looking in the mirror, she asked if everything was too old and apologized. But Arya replied that it looked as good as new, and she liked it very much. Meanwhile, she noticed that the Marquis has only one son, and if this dress is old, it might mean that it is his mother's. Arya was walking down the stairs, but she felt strange because her mommy used to walk down them too. She hadn't had one in her past life, so this was her only mom. So she was upset again. What she could find only once in two lives, she lost too quickly. And now she misses her very much. Finally, they came to the Marquis, who looked at the little girl in the dress and was sad. So he told Lucy to tell the dressmaker to make her a new dress. The girl was confused. Surely he did not like her wearing her mother's dress. Arya thought it was because she didn't look like her. Ernest, on the other hand, could not stop crying. He remembered that it was his little sister Gloria's favorite dress, so he decided to give his only niece lots of clothes. But first, he planned to go hunting to get some nice fur for a coat and muff. They sat down at the table. The Marquis knew that formalities must be observed, but his dear niece's face was too far away, so he ordered her chair to be changed. Ernest wished the girl a good meal, and they began to eat. She thanked him, but in her mind, she was forcing herself to chew her food carefully so as not to get indigestion and cause another problem. Arya planned to tell him about the elixir, but the Marquis was only amazed at how pretty she was even when she was eating. He remembered how Jalen had said she was very nervous, 
so he told himself to be dignified and trustworthy to calm her down. Now Ernest was sure that whoever opposed her would be a strong support and an uncle who could protect and comfort her. The Marquis was so absorbed in his thoughts and instructions that he forgot what he looked like when he was angry, so the butler reminded him to control himself. The girl was happy, though a little surprised. Everyone smiled at her all the time, just like Lucy. And no one avoided her gaze. It was very different from Castle Elder. In the Duchy of Elder, no one smiled at her except her father, and she wanted to be loved by everyone. After Arya remembered her past life, she realized that all her efforts had been in vain. But now that she knows this, she is even more confused. The girl wanted someone to smile at her so much. She realized that she did not want to go back, so she had to hurry and make a deal. She told the Marquis that she wanted to talk to him because she had something important to tell him. It was very important. But he first asked her if she had finished her meal. And when she said yes, he noticed that she didn't eat much and that they hadn't even brought dessert. Then the girl began to apologize for not following the etiquette. She promised not to make this mistake again. However, the others did not expect such a response and were surprised. So the Marquis turned to her and told her that she was seven years old, not 17, and that she shouldn't appear older than she really was. Arya replied that she would keep that in mind, but Ernest was worried that it sounded like he was scolding her. Meanwhile, the girl was also afraid that she would be sent back to Elder at this rate, so she asked if the Marquis could call the Archimagus. She added that he should also see what she wanted to show them, everything her father had done to her. Eris listened carefully to the girl and ordered the butler to call his father to them. But he objected because the archmage was in the West Tower and had not left it for several days. The Marquis said that the old man was very stubborn, so he ordered the butler to tell him that if he did not come now, the princess would be sent back to Elder immediately. A few minutes passed and the archmage burst into the room shouting. He shouted that his son had gone mad and how could he send the child back? He grabbed him by his clothes and told him that if he did that, he would kill him with his own hands. But he stopped Solana and asked him to look to the side. There stood little Arya, watching in amazement. Ernest asked how long he would avoid them. He told him not to even think about running away again. Was he not going to see his granddaughter for the rest of his life? Arya thought that the great archmage might consider her a thorn in his side. That's why he hadn't communicated with her until now. Finally, she appealed to him to listen to her, even if he didn't want to see her and had seen something. In her hands, a bottle with an unknown substance appeared in front of the astonished adults. Arya explained that it was something that could cure diseases caused by filth. While the Marquis was pulling the Archimage's hands away from him, the girl began to open the bottle. They were afraid that the water was contaminated and rushed to her, shouting at her to put it down and give it to them, for she was supposed to be a good girl. But Arya ignored them and continued to open it and then poured all the liquid from it on her hand. The Marquis was frightened and quickly drew his sword, he thought that if he cut off her hand before the infection spread to the rest of her body, they could save her. But the girl assured her that she was fine and would not die. She explained that it was a cure for the contaminated water, an elixir that could cure the filth. Finally, she confessed that it was the result of the experiments that Duke Elder had been performing on her. The archmage examined the girl's hand, and they could not believe it. It did not fit in their minds how Duke Elder could have experimented on her, in what sense. The girl replied that he had given her an elixir and then poured contaminated water on her and checked what would happen. The scars on her arm are the results of these experiments. Subsequently, the Marquis went to a doctor and asked if there was any chance that Aria had been infected. The doctor replied that it was rare to see a poison that completely destroyed the body in this way. He added that if we are talking about infection, it is quite possible. But if she was infected, she would have died by now. How could she still be alive? Then the Marquis realized that he was right that she had been infected. However, he did not think it was possible. How could the Duke dare to do this? It was such a cruel thing to do. The Archmage could not get away from his granddaughter and asked when he had started experimenting on her. Arya replied that perhaps when she was four years old. It was then that he realized that she was perfect for experimenting with elixirs. The grandfather was very worried that it was his fault. Then the girl gave him the bottle and said it was a gift for saving her life. If he listened to her request, she would prepare the perfect elixir for him. The archmage asked what perfect meant. Arya said that right now he's like poison to others. Only she could withstand its effects. She added that it was ineffective in many ways, but she could improve it while she was here if he gave her the ingredients. Instead, she asked to be protected from the duke until she is older. She doesn't want to go back to the elder duchy. The girl looked at the adults, but they were silent, and she began to worry. However, she realized that this was not such a bad deal. Arya wondered if she needed to give more proof that the elixir would be a cure. So she stated that the duke would not be able to complete the elixir as long as she was away from him. And she added that they would be able to make a decision after she had finished the perfect elixir.
The Marquis then asked if this was all the contaminated water she had. The girl was surprised and said that if they had any more contaminated water, she could test it. However, they emphasized that she did not need to do so. She was already suffering so much. Arya looked at their upset faces and could not understand why they were looking at her like that. Even after seeing the effects of the elixir, all they could say was that she was suffering. Therefore, the girl replied to the Marquis that she knew it was a difficult decision, and they might have problems with the Duchy of Elder. However, the Marquis reassured her and said that she shouldn't worry about the darn Duchy. It was not a problem for him. He put his hand on her small fingers and regretted that he had not been a reliable person for her. He was worried that it could not be fixed. He asked her to wait a little longer. While the Marquis was calling for the butler, Solon asked her if she hated her grandfather. She replied that she did not hate him. The Archmage asked if she did not hold a grudge against him, even though he had not helped her when she was suffering. The girl replied that he did not know about it. The grandfather agreed that he did not know, but asked if that did not make him despise her even more. He added that she should be more angry that he did not know. However, the girl pointed out that her grandfather did not have to know about her situation. The Archmage explained that this was not the case because she was not just a stranger, but his only granddaughter. He asked if it made sense that the old man did not know how she lived, even though he should have. He emphasized that Arya should have hated and despised him for that, but the girl could not understand why he was so sorry. In the original story, he had turned a blind eye to it until the very end. Wasn't she the granddaughter who had killed his daughter? Suddenly, the Marquis returned to the room and handed the girl a document. He explained that it was a formal contract drawn up by their family. It is designed to make a promise that cannot be broken, and it will come into force as soon as she signs it. But she noticed that the notes at the bottom were blank. And this is the part where it should be stated what the girl will give in return. But the Marquis said that there was no need to write anything. Arya pointed out that he would lose out, but he replied that it was not his loss. Ernest looked into her surprised eyes and assured her that it was to gain her trust. But Arya disagreed, saying that the elixir was a miracle that many people wanted. She said that the Marquis might monopolize it. But her uncle said that the elixir is her power and property. So he was not rude enough to take what was hers. Ernest could see her surprise. So he added that he just wanted to be a member of her family that she could rely on and trust. As he escorted her happily out of the room, he emphasized that this was the price he was paying to become her real uncle. When the girl left, the archmage said that he had done a commendable job. After all, having a family contract would be an encouraging factor for the child. The Marquis turned to the father and asked if he had seen that she was very happy after she accepted the signed contract. Ernest remarked that, although they were related by blood, she still did not dare to trust them. And then the archmage took up his head. He had never felt such regret in his life. He remembered how irritated he had been when he first saw her. Yet there she was, clinging to him, so old and miserable, begging him to take her away. He felt sorry for the way she asked him. It was a cry for help, and he hadn't realized it until she cried. Grandpa wished he had come earlier. He had picked her up too late. And Gloria? But he was interrupted by Ernest, who said that they should prepare for a long battle, for they could not do nothing else. The Marquis's eyes were filled with anger and hatred, and he insisted that they must destroy this wretch, Duke Elder. The Archmage thought about it, but Ernest said that they could only count on the knights to mobilize and end this quickly. The history of the Golden Horn Knights of the Duchy of Elder is compared to that of their Snow Leopard Knights. Nevertheless, Solon cooled down, sat down opposite his son, and asked him not to engage in politics. To the Marquis's surprise, he asked who he was. He replied that he was his father. But he said that he was the teacher of the former royal wizard, the Archmage of the Magic Tower, a member of the Continental League of Wizards, and an advisor to the Abusal royal family. He began to shout at his son that he was the Marquis of Weaver, his firstborn son, and also the ruler of Garcia. And he asked who would suffer the most when the Weaver family stopped destroying the labyrinths. The Marquis had no reason to object because the royal family would suffer. Besides, Weaver imports most of his food from Durado. He also asked where the gold from the Elder Duchy's mines was distributed, and the man replied that it was among the top officials of Garcia. The penultimate question was the one on which he stopped arguing, and that was where the source of the Luoma River, which supplies the granaries of the Duchy of Elder, is located, and it was in Quizilla. And he finished him off by asking him the name of his wife, and he answered that her name was Celiana of Quisella. He assured him that for one who knew this, all he could think of was that it might be a long war. And he wondered how he could be so stupid when he had such a big head. The Archmage said that the only person he could trust was Selly. So he said that he would take care of Ariadne's guardianship and told him to go and deal with everything else. The Marquis asked if he was referring to the investigation of the experiment involving the child. He replied that he did and also emphasized that he would look into Gloria's accident. 
But Ernest said that he thought he already knew that Gloria was then trapped in the horse's grave maze that had opened up near the elder estate. Horse Tomb was a low-level maze that was easily destroyed by the Knights of the Golden Horn. Gloria went to support the group responsible for cleaning up the contaminated areas. To save Gloria, Duke Elder was the first to go to the contaminated area. The organized cleanup team was much larger than usual. Clearing a low-level maze area does not involve monster attacks, so it was a relatively safe operation. Nevertheless, as soon as Gloria entered the contaminated area, she began to show signs of poisoning and died. The Marquis said that was all that was confirmed and asked his father if he had found anything else. But the Archmage only regretted that nothing more was known because the case had been well cleaned up. In any case, if a cure for filth has been created through experimentation, it can also be used as a poison. He explained that the symptoms would appear immediately after contact with the contaminated water, regardless of whether the victim was alive. This is not suitable for poisoning oneself, but the Archmage held the bottle in his hands and added that Duke Elder could have infected Gloria without anyone knowing. Ernest agreed that this was indeed suspicious. He said that he would investigate again and focus on how the infection occurred. Solon added that he would need to look into it as well. Finally, as the Archmage was about to leave, he turned to his son and told him not to get involved in politics again and to make decisions only after consulting Selly. Arya looked at every word of the contract and was glad that she could now rest easy, but she couldn't believe they would do it for nothing. She remembered that when she had talked about the elixir, it hadn't been what she had expected. And it wasn't just that. Their reaction was different from what she had imagined, and not only then. Were those warm touches and words sincere? The way the Archmage and the Marquis looked at her was so much like her mother's. Like her mother trying to get her out of the study room, those eyes seemed to express love. But remembering her uncle's words that she could trust him, Arya couldn't help herself. Having heard that, she now expected something from them, perhaps that she would finally have a family. One day she was playing with her uncle in the kindergarten, and he was holding her in his arms. The girl said she could walk on her own, but he told her not to worry and to just tell him anything she wanted. Then Arya couldn't understand why he looked so kind, even though he was cold around others. They walked straight ahead, and there were many plants around them. Then Arya asked what this place was. The Marquis said that it was a place her grandfather had made for her grandmother. The girl was surprised that it was created by an archmage, but Ernest explained that he had planted all those flowers himself with magic so that she could walk there even in winter. Ernest promised that they would go outside when the snowstorm stopped. He added that when spring came, they would go to the lake and swim there in the summer. Suddenly, the girl turned to the Marquis and said that she could see where the Archmage was hiding, and he kept spying on them. The Marquis said he knew about it and told her not to worry about it. But when Arya asked him why he kept doing it, he explained that he had asked him the same thing, because he was no longer a child. They were looking through the clear glass, and Arya asked when the blizzard would end. Ernest replied that spring would be here soon, and her aunt and cousin would be back by then. The girl guessed that by cousin he might mean Eric Weaver. He is an associate of Axel Valentine, the protagonist of the story, a student of the Archmage as well as the genius wizard himself, a person who plays an important role in changing the ending of the original story. She read that he has a bit of a prickly temper and often likes to start fights with the main character. The girl was worried that they would not be able to get along, so she needed to win his trust and make the elixir as soon as possible. But the Marquis assured her that everyone would be happy to see her. He carried her into the room in his arms. Though she begged to be let go, Ernest explained that they had to take care of her so that she would get well soon, and they would go out more when the doctor said they could. But the girl wanted to tell him something, and suddenly the butler came in and said that they had a visitor. So the Marquis asked Ariadne to tell him what she needed a little later. She agreed to do so. When they left the room, Ernest asked who could have come so suddenly, since there had been no notice of anyone's visit. But the man said it was from the Duchy of Elder. However, the girl heard them talking and was terrified. She was afraid that Duke Elder was already here. She ran to the window to look out, for she did not expect him to arrive until early spring. But she reassured herself that she had a contract and everything would be fine. Meanwhile, Belver at Lictus entered the palace. He introduced himself and said that he was now a Knight of the Golden Horn, albeit a lowly one. Ernest was calm and composed, but after hearing what he had said, he told him that he was very modest for a knight. Lictus said that, as expected, he was indeed the one known as the Shield of the North. The Marquis then asked what brought him here on such a day, for the journey must have been difficult. He said that he had brought a letter from Duke Elder, and he joked that he had heard of many blizzards in Weaver, but this was beyond imagination. And he added that in the middle of their journey, he was sure they were in serious trouble. The Marquis asked if he was an escort knight. Belveret replied that he was, 
and they could not neglect the safety of the princess on her journey from Weaver. The uncle listened attentively to the story that their lord had many concerns, so he had instructed Lictus to accompany the princess. Before he could finish his report, he threw the crumpled letter at her feet and assured her that she did not need it. He said that he was very sorry, but his lord's orders said that he must accompany the princess back. He asked where she was now. Ernest furrowed his brow and replied that the princess was resting right now, so he could go back without any delay. The knight said that he could not do this and asked to see her, but he stood his ground and said it was impossible, so he should go back. But Lictus wanted to know why they were hiding the princess, if there was any reason why he would not let him see her. And he added that it was not possible that the noble weaver was keeping his niece in prison. And he asked if it was true that he did not. The knight made the Marquise very angry with these words. He asked him what kind of nonsense he was talking and whether he thought he was the same as his lord. Finally, Ernest ordered his soldiers to seize Belveray and escort him out of the castle with the other guests. The knight tried to resist, but it was no use. So he emphasized that Ernest Weaver was bringing trouble on himself. At the same time, the girl was back in the library with Ree. She had brought her some cookies and was reading a book. She felt a little better with her, for she had been frightened when she heard about the elders coming. But while she was there, she wanted to find out more about Eric Weaver. And she managed to find his first appearance. Suddenly, Ree started pulling Arya to leave. She shouted, It's dangerous, Arya! Go, quickly! We have to go! The girl did not understand what danger there could be and asked if Ree could know what was happening outside the library. But she answered, I don't know. A sense of danger, a premonition, a smell. Spirit was worried. It was strange to her. She touched the girl's head and a bright light appeared. And Aria came back to reality to her room and found herself sleeping in bed. She wondered if it was Ree who had brought her back. She seemed to be capable of such things, but she didn't understand why it was so dark. She wondered if she had been asleep for so long. Strange. She hadn't even eaten dinner yet. If she hadn't slept so soundly, Lucy would have woken her up to eat. And why did Ree say it was dangerous outside? But when Arya got closer to the window, she realized that it wasn't night and saw something coming toward her from a distance. It was a knight of the Duchy of Elder. She recognized him by the symbol on his armor. The girl was afraid that it was the knight of the Golden Horn. In a moment, he broke the glass in the room and approached her. He explained that he was here to save her and she should go home. But when he heard that she did not want to, he said that he wanted to accompany her nobly, but perhaps there was nothing to be done. His black arms were over the little helpless girl and he called her to him, but the archmage appeared behind her. He asked how dare a vile rat like him come here. The knight saw that he could use magic without a spell, as expected of an archmage, but he said that he had no intention of fighting him, but simply asked him to give him the girl. Solon replied that it seems that young people these days do not understand why he's called an archmage. He added that if he left now, he would spare his life. The knight smiled, saying that he did not dare to look down on the archmage, and at the same time he waved his hand upward, where the bottle flew into the air. In order to protect his granddaughter, the grandfather used magic and the bottle broke. Drops of contaminated water began to fly out. Arya knew that most spells could not stop it, so she ran ahead of the archmage and used her mind to turn them away. The knight made a disgusted face and was furious, for he could not understand how this was possible. Grandfather said that he would not succeed, and that he should have studied the story of how he fought against the polluted air. He asked him if he hadn't read any books. The archmage hit him several times with lightning bolts, and he had no choice but to run away quickly. Later, when the knight flew away, the grandfather asked the girl excitedly how she could have been so reckless. Why had she blocked her grandfather's view? He said that he did not know what he would do if something happened to her. Then Arya explained that she could not die from the filth in the air, but the archmage could. Grandfather was angry that she had decided to put herself in mortal danger just because of this. He thought she was underestimating him. He was the one who had to protect her. Finally, the archmage hugged her tightly and told her that she was only a child. It was his duty to protect her. He called her a foolish girl and asked her how she could ever protect him. He also warned her that she should prepare herself for her grandfather's scolding. Later, Solan took her in his arms and carried her to her uncle. He urged her not to worry, for the Marquis may seem unreliable, but his strength is comparable to four or five knights combined. And he added that he should have already dealt with all the knights of Elder in the Weaver style, of course. The girl asked what this style meant. The grandfather explained that they leave only one person to move around when the others are unable to get up. So, Ernest remarked that he had left them one man to take care of the others on the way back, A. Since he hadn't killed the whole group and left one man unharmed, it made it a fair fight. Arya asked if it was definitely okay to do this, and the grandfather replied that it was. In the story, the elder family is known for their great wealth and power. If you treat them like this, things might not go well. 
But is the Weaver family strong enough to fight the Elder Duchy? The girl pointed out that the Duke would never back down, but the Archmage assured her that it didn't matter. He added that the Elder family might be more famous and wealthy than theirs. But that was all. Arya remembered that Eric Weaver had been mentioned in the novel in passing, and she hadn't realized that the family was so high profile. Finally, the Marquis came into the room, and Grandfather immediately attacked him for allowing that rat to endanger a child in her own room. When Ernest asked what he was talking about, he told the girl that the Marquis had only a big body, but he was useless. And he asked when Celiana would return. The Marquis was not happy that his father trusted his daughter-in-law more than his own son, but he remembered that he had to defeat Celia at least once. His record is 289 defeats out of 289 fights. Ernest was furious and proved that he was simply not good at fighting. There were two matches that ended in a draw. Grandpa joked that this was something to be proud of, but his uncle reminded him that it was an achievement to draw with his wife. The Marquis wanted to take the girl, but Salon took his hands away. The uncle remarked that the Archmage used to avoid her, but now he doesn't even let her out of his hands. The grandfather replied that he had already spent a lot of time with her, so he told him not to be stingy. The Archmage told the girl that she had her uncle and grandfather with her, so she had nothing to worry about, for she was only a child and already worried about many things. He explained that she should concentrate on growing up like a normal child, without any worries. The girl was confused by these words. How could she be a child when she had been told in her memory that she did not look like a child at all? It was disgusting to him. However, on the other hand, the Marquis emphasized that she was only seven years old, not seventeen, and should not act older than her age. But in the original story, Ariadne died as a child, and the reason she remembered her past life could be the key to survival. If her will to live is what allowed her to recover her memories from the past, then it must mean that if she wants to survive, she must never act like a normal child again. She cannot blindly trust everything she sees. If she lets her guard down, she is young and helpless and will never survive. But sometimes she is driven mad when she doubts someone's goodwill. So the girl apologized to her grandfather for not being like a child and assured him that she would try harder. But the Marquis said that she had been through a lot of unbearable suffering, which explained why she was acting so mature. He assured her that it was not her fault, but the fault of the adults. It was a tragedy that she was not acting like a child. The grandfather added that he did not blame her for this. After all, they just hope that she will trust them. It's heartbreaking to see her carry this burden alone. The girl then asked if they were sad because she did not rely on them. The archmage replied that it was not only that. He is her grandfather and Ernest is her uncle. Therefore, she is their family. But it was natural for Aria to act like a child. She was pleased that they would be happy to protect her and keep her safe. She hoped that she really didn't have to go through this alone anymore and that they would become a loving family that would always be there for her no matter what. Her eyes filled with tears and she asked if she could trust them and hug them. And when her grandfather said, of course, she clung to him and asked him to stay with her. Solon replied that of course she could, and when Arya asked him if she could call him grandpa, he also agreed. The Marquis joined them and said that she could call him uncle and asked him to hug her as well. However, the Archmage denied Ernest's tearful requests, saying that his stupidity might be passed on to her. Meanwhile, the Duke was going mad. His plan was to have the Knights of the Snow Leopard force their way in, but it failed. But he realized that this only proved that the child had definitely been kidnapped. The fact that they had driven the knight away without even allowing him to look at her explained, obviously, that the weavers were preparing to strike back, which means he has a reason to fight back. So he already had a plan in his head. He was sure he would get her home. One day, Arya saw her uncle go outside to meet his wife and son. She asked to go with him to greet them because she had been waiting to meet them for a long time. He allowed her to go in, but said that it was cold outside and that it would be better to wait inside. With that, the nannies came running out with their clothes and began to dress the girl. One of them reprimanded the Marquis, saying that he should have known that my lady could easily get sick in the cold and that he should be more careful. After all, she still had sudden nosebleeds and feigning spells. Ernest waited patiently while she was fitted for gloves and a scarf and given a hot water bottle and finally asked if he could take her with him now that they were finished. So they started toward the gate. Arya looked back and saw everyone worried that she would come back safe and sound and wondered about it. They had not gone far when suddenly the Marquis asked her to wait and stand still. He shouted Nanbora at the top of his voice and an elemental animal appeared before them. They are not to be confused with ordinary animals. While an archmage harnesses the power of the elements and turns it into magic, elemental knights must contract with the spirit of an animal that has feelings but no ability to use its power. The knights form a bond with them to borrow and use their power. Meanwhile, 
the spirit retains its essence and physical form and can use the mind of the contractor. The girl watched carefully and wondered what kind of spirit she herself would contract with in the future. Now that she thought about it, there was a great elemental living on the mountain behind Weaver Castle, and perhaps in time she would be able to make contact with him. The Marquis called the girl to him and told her to hold on tight. They mounted the animal and jumped over the gate. Finally, the knights of the Snow Leopard flew and rode toward them on horseback and on animals. The first person they met was Veronica Brand, a knight of the elements from the Snow Leopards. The Marquis remarked that she must have been a little angry this time, because she was bleeding. But she replied that it was the blood of a monster they had met in the mountains when they had lost their way. The girl noticed the girl next to Ernest and asked what it was, if it was alive at all. He replied that she should be careful what she said because it was his niece. Veronica got down from her horse and asked in surprise if he really had a niece. Ernest said that he had mentioned it in a letter and asked if she had received it. Aria was a little scared because there was blood on her mittens, and Veronica was surprised that the girl was moving and really alive. The Marquis began to shout at her about how dare she touch her and that she should wash her face first. But behind him, Selly called out, Siliana Quisella is the Marquis of Weaver's niece and captain of the Knights of the Snow Leopard. She asked Ernie how he was doing, since it had been almost six months. Ernest was happy to see his wife. He threw his arms around her and told her that he had missed her very much. Their son, Eric Weaver, the heir to the Weaver family and a disciple of the Archimagus, saw this. He remarked that if anyone saw them, they would be mistaken for newlyweds. Eric asked them to limit their expressions of love to reasonable limits. And he remarked that it was strange that he still had no younger brother or sister. Then he noticed Aria and asked his father who she was and why she was sitting on the Marquis's elemental. Aria looked at Eric and couldn't understand. He had to be about 16 years old, but he seemed younger than the story described. He wondered how Veronica could like such a tiny and cute girl. He noticed that Aria was ugly, very thin, and had big eyes that made her head look like a skull. Veronica argued that he was the only one who could be ugly here. Eric asked her if she was blind, where he could be ugly. Then the girl said that it was in his heart. This really hurt Eric. He began to shout how dare she say such a thing to a future lord. Veronica replied that she would quit working here when he became one, but she shut him up, telling him he was nothing but a narrow-minded braggart, and left. Then he came closer to the girl and addressed her as if she were a skull, asking who she was to look down on the air to Weaver and ride Nanbora. He began to pull her by the hand and wanted to take her downstairs, but her father came up and asked what he was doing. Eric asked who she was, but Ernest was focused on the girl's injured arm although Arya assured him that everything was fine. However, the Marquis realized that this could not be good. So he turned to his wife and warned her that he had to take Arya back first. Selly understood and said that they could meet later. When she returned, the girl was in thought. Eric is 16, and this could mean that he is just in the middle of a transition and perhaps, because of his rebellious behavior, he seems immature compared to the novel. Therefore, I was worried whether I would be able to get close to him. At the castle, Arya listened to the story that Eric had been scolded and that his punishment would probably last until the summer. She was upset that their first meeting had been spoiled, but she remembered Veronica. She thought she looked different from the others, and she asked Lucy if she happened to know her, and if she was an elemental knight as well. And she replied that if she was talking about Veronica Brand, she was the same age as Eric. Two years ago, she saved someone from an infected neighborhood. At that time, she was already a knight of the elements. Even though she is the youngest of the other knights, she can fight side by side with them in hunting monsters. The girl was surprised to become a knight at the age of 14. In the novel, Axel Valentine had already become a knight at the age of 12. If she was so gifted at the age of 14, without being the main character, she was certainly called a genius among elementalists. One thing that Arya could not figure out was why Veronica was never mentioned in the story. Perhaps she had been killed before the story began, just like Ariadne. However, there is a scene where Eric gets drunk and makes a big fuss. He was crying and talking all the time about his first love being dead. Fighting defilement is a holy war to protect against demons. Labyrinths and pollution have existed for a long time. People have fought against them stubbornly. But the great labyrinth that opened a few years ago changed everything. Its appearance immediately destroyed an entire prosperous empire and slowly led the world to destruction. At this time, a ray of hope appeared, Axel Valentine. He would be the first person to return alive after the battle with the Great Maze. And since then, he will come back and challenge it again. Clearly, five people is the ideal number for a mop-up team. And the optimal composition of this group is at least one elementalist, a wizard, a priest, and an elemental knight. But for the squad you are planning to create, you still need to find a priest and an elemental knight. 
If Veronica, Eric's first love, has died, the question remains whether she can change her fate. Veronica will be a talented person who can take the place of the elemental knight in the squad, and the girl became convinced that she needed to learn more about her. But her thoughts were interrupted by Lucy, who invited her into the room where the Marquise's wife was waiting. The girl went in and said she was glad to meet Madame. Saliana Casella just laughed and said that she could call her aunt. She said that the Marquis had written to her about her in a letter, but she never received it because the messenger disappeared without a trace. So she heard from him about her situation much later. Ariadne listened attentively to Selly, who sympathized with her for having endured so much hardship and for having made her way here, even though it would have been difficult for a knight. She observed that the girl was brave enough, and it would not be surprising if she were not tired from such a hard battle. But in her opinion, she was like a warrior preparing for the next battle. Arya wondered if she really looked like a warrior. But her aunt explained that a warrior is not just someone who holds a sword. Anyone who is willing to fight for victory is a warrior. She said that her husband treats her as if she were as fragile as porcelain. But she thinks that even if her body is weak, her will is as strong as steel. And she sees that the girl is a strong child. The aunt joked that it would be nice if Eric was half as good as Arya, and at the same time showed her a present. She explained that it was for the girl's birthday, which she had heard was recently. The girl thanked her. Sally added that she had made it in a hurry, so she didn't have many options. She asked if she knew what it was. Ari replied that it was a spiritual lantern. Then the aunt suggested that she already had one, but when Aria told her it was her first lantern, she was shocked. She had long since grown beyond the age when she should have received her first spiritual lantern. She was horrified to realize that she'd been exposed to contaminated water all this time and had not had the opportunity to receive a means of preventing contamination. Sally was amazed because a spiritual lantern is one of those things that parents always give to their children. She gave the girl her first spiritual lantern and remarked that she had accomplished so much alone and that her dear niece was a great worker. The aunt also emphasized that if her uncle and grandfather objected to certain things because they were worried about her, she could come to her. Arya then asked if she understood that even if she wanted to do something and they would not allow it, her aunt would secretly support her. Selly winked at her and smiled and assured her that she would help her and it would be their secret. When Arya left her aunt, she could not believe that she had made such a promise to a child, but she was glad that she seemed to like her. The girl noticed that all the relatives on her mother's side were such kind people. And thanks to her grandfather, she finally finished the elixir. But first, she had to test the effect. She could have made it faster if she hadn't been sick so often. She wondered what the point of being reborn as a princess was. If she hadn't remembered her past life, she would have died. She realized that she was quite pretty, but she looked too much like a duke, which was a little annoying. The girl was walking and wondering if it made sense that the world she had read about in the story in her past life was real. It was written by God or someone like that, but it didn't really matter. Still, she forced herself not to worry about unnecessary things. Suddenly, she stopped and realized that it must be here somewhere. Finally, she found the infected plant. It was a daffodil that used to bloom beautifully and had a pleasant scent. She opened her little bottle and began to pour the elixir on the flowers to see what it would do. Finally, she was very happy because the daffodils had recovered. However, she heard someone behind her asking what she was doing here. Arya turned around and saw Eric, so she greeted him as if he were her brother. She was a little surprised because she thought he was being punished. So she didn't understand how he could have gotten out, but she was going to find him anyway. However, the boy did not like that she called him brother and asked why she called him that. Arya was confused and asked if he had heard anything about her from his uncle. He said that he had, but he didn't care. Eric told her not to think that he would love her right away just because she was his cousin. He doesn't plan to be her brother, so she shouldn't pretend to be close to him. But the girl did not understand why the boy was so hostile to an eight-year-old child. So she asked him why he didn't like her. He asked why she wanted to know. He said that this was not a playground, so she should leave immediately. But the girl said that her grandfather said she could stay here. Then Eric got angry, wondering if she was learning magic from him. But Arya denied it. He was worried that she was here to learn the basics. He was worried that she might want to become an elemental knight and inherit his father's ability to summon Nanbora. Arya had read that the bad attitude of elemental knights was some kind of complex, but it seemed to be true. She really needed to get along with Eric, but she didn't have to put up with that attitude. So she explained to Count Weaver that she was the heir to the elder family. She asked him to greet her properly. To the boy's surprise, she added that she was the first to do so only because he was her cousin. But if he was not, shouldn't the Earl show his respect? When Eric pointed out that she was eight years old, she said yes. But she noticed that he was still speaking to her informally. She asked if he was being too rough with the future Duchess. The boy was going crazy. 
He remembered how everyone had told him she was nice, but she was really a sassy girl. Eric asked if his father knew about this side of her. He promised to go and tell him about it. But she replied that she was not here to learn magic or to become a knight of the elements, but to finish the experiment, and she had already done it. So he left, just as he wanted. The boy was surprised at the experiment and wanted her to stop and explain it to him, but it was no use. Suddenly, he noticed the daffodils. The flowers were so fresh and beautiful, though they had recently withered away. The girl was about to rest because she had walked too much today and was tired when she was called by Eric, who asked her if she had cured the infected plants. Arya turned to him tiredly and he saw that her nose was bleeding, so he was very scared. The bleeding did not stop, but the girl reassured him that he shouldn't worry because it wasn't his fault and she was just tired. As Arya said this, she began to fall and fainted. Eric tried to catch her and barely managed to do so. He touched her forehead and felt it burning. So he said that at this rate, this child would die. Meanwhile, the girl was in the library where Ree was telling her to rest. Arya asked the spirit if she had called her here. And she tried to explain in a broken tongue that she had brought her here because she didn't like to see Arya hurt. The girl looked at Ri and did not understand how she did it. She kicks her out whenever she wants and now she's called her back. Arya was very sleepy, so Ri stroked her and told her she needed to rest. Soon the girl woke up in her bed in her own room. When she opened her eyes, she saw many people around her. Everyone was standing around crying. They had finally waited for her to wake up because they were worried about her. So after the priest, a doctor began to examine her. After that, he noticed that she had almost completely recovered. But she should exercise to improve her stamina. The Marquis hugged the priest and thanked him sincerely. But he replied that he had simply used the power God had given him. Then the girl noticed that he had golden eyes. She remembered that all people who can use divine power have golden eyes. And she wondered if her eyes would also be golden if she could use it. After the Marquis and the priest left, Sally came to the girl. She told her that she had slept for two days. She asked if she was hungry. Aria replied that she was, and Lucy ran off to get something warm to eat. Finally, the doctor decided to tell her something. He told her what he had noticed when he had examined her and made sure she was no longer in pain. Aria asked what this meant, and he explained that even if she had a wound, she would feel pain in a dulled way compared to other people. But when she asked if this was not a good thing, the doctor said that it was the opposite. She needs to feel pain to be more careful. Since she can't feel it, she can easily overwork herself. Last time Eric hurt her hand, she didn't feel any pain. And this time, she didn't either. If it were a normal person, she would have felt the pain and laid down to rest before the nosebleed started. He explained that the pain was a warning from her body. When she can't feel the pain signal from her body, it depends on the situation, of course. But it can be extremely dangerous. The doctor asked her to remember this and to always pay attention to her physical condition. The girl replied that she would follow his advice. Then he added that thanks to divine power, most of the side effects should disappear. Arya asked if she could run and walk as much as she wanted now. The doctor replied that she could, but he made her promise not to overdo it. When he left, she hugged Selly. She said that everything was fine now and that all she had to do was get healthier. Later, she began to feed her the soup Lucy had brought and casually told her that Eric said he had thought about his behavior. But he was still so immature, so he could always start a fight with her again. She added that there are also bad people who might try to ambush her. So to make sure she was safe when she left the house, they needed to have a night with her. The girl wondered how she would have a night to accompany her. At that moment, they heard a knock at the door, and Veronica Brand entered the room. The girl did not think she would see her like this again. But Celiana noticed that although she was young, she was very experienced. She asked Veronica if she knew what to do if Eric did something dangerous to Arya, and Veronica said that she would make sure that the girl would not get hurt. The woman was pleased and told her not to give him any more encouragement, until she broke all his bones and stopped hitting him. However, the girl was upset to hear this. She asked if Brother Eric had been scolded for making her faint. She explained that it was not his fault that she was hurt. After all, it was he who had carried her to the castle. The aunt confirmed that it was indeed Eric who brought her after she fainted and took her to Jalen in time for treatment, but she heard what he did to her. However, the girl kept repeating that she was just tired, and that's why she fainted. And her aunt said that Eric had assumed she would say that, so she would have to forget about the situation. Arya was not expecting to hear that. Really, the guy admits that he was wrong. It was a very rare sight. After a while, when she was feeling better, she began to count her bottles. She had prepared them for her grandfather, aunt, uncle, Erica, Veronica, and there was one last bottle. She wanted to give it to Rye, but if she really was an elemental, she didn't need it. Besides, she was always in the library, so she probably wouldn't have to use it. Four. The girl looked at the first elixir she had made and finally decided to give one to Rai, because giving someone a gift makes her happy. 
Moreover, she had asked her for information about Veronica and she needed to see her and give her the potion. She also wanted to ask her how she had summoned her to the library. So Arya made herself comfortable in the chair and fell asleep, hoping to go back to the library. So after a while, she found herself inside, but no matter how many times she called out to Rai, she was nowhere to be found. Although she always came to her and hugged her, saying that she had been waiting for her for a long time. Suddenly, she finally heard her voice. Ri was sitting with a book and shouted that she was there. Seeing the spirit, Arya was puzzled by her joy. However, Ri kept talking about the benefits and the discovery, the great discovery. The girl wanted to get closer, but there was a glass wall between them. So she asked if she could go into the other classrooms. They tried to meet, but Arya couldn't get through to Ri. Finally, she asked her to try to go through the wall by herself, and she succeeded. She was so excited that Arya could not understand what she was saying. The girl smiled and wondered why the child hadn't said she could get out from the beginning. But she replied that Arya had not asked. Because, no question, the result is no answer. She asked if she should be scolded for this, but the girl was not angry. Arya asked if the second room in the imaginary library was someone study like this place. When Ri asked if anyone was studying, Arya explained that she meant if the other rooms were filled with books that other people had read in their lifetime. But the spirit assured her that there was no one here. This is a fantasy library and only Arya comes here alone. She said that every day she waited, searched, explored, but no one was there. Then Arya promised to come more often so she wouldn't be so lonely. So Ri said she found something about Veronica, and she opened the report on the conquest of the maze to Lalich. Whether this was the labyrinth that appeared in the mountains behind Weaver's castle was in question. The first attempt to close the labyrinth failed, and the flood of monsters led to the destruction of the defense line. As a result, the castle was severely damaged. Veronica Brand, a 24-year-old knight of the Snow Leopards, died defending Count Eric Weaver from the monster Mimicry. But one thing Arya couldn't understand was that if Veronica was 24 years old, it wasn't a record of the past. Re shouted joyfully that there were 10 volumes in the novel. She had found everything. But Veronica's name was not there. She also read others, searched, discovered. Spirit was looking forward to being praised. However, she thought that if she could not find the information about Veronica's death in the original story, then she must have gone to another section of the library to find it. Could this be from someone's office, someone who lives somewhere in this world, and this is information about a future that has not yet come? The imaginary library is the book she read in her past life, but it contains information about another world that is different from hers. If Ree has access to the information of this world, and she has no limitations, then she can have access to all the information and knowledge that exists, and she is the perfect solution. The girl praised the spirit for doing a good job, and she was happy. So Arya asked her to find other books as well. Re exclaimed that she was sad, rest, all the time. But she asked what Arya wanted to know. And then the girl asked her to find out about the death of Gloria Weaver, Duchess of Elder. Re gave the girl a big hug and said she would do everything she could to find it, to look it up for her. So she thanked her for that. And she gave her a small bottle with a ribbon wrapped around it, containing one of her first elixirs that she had made. But Re thought at first that the gift was a ribbon and suggested that she tie it around her head. But Arya explained that the gift was what was inside the bottle. But the spirit still wanted Arya to tie the ribbon on her head, so she did. Re was very pleased. Later, Arya gave the elixir to Veronica, who was surprised that she had made it herself. However, she explained that she could use it if she was hurt, as she could drink it or pour it on her wound. The girl thanked her, and Arya asked if she really needed to use the power of the elements if they were just being directed to Eric. And she replied that she didn't want to bring a ladder, and she just wanted to be able to hug her for once. Suddenly, Veronica noticed that they had broken the tiles and was upset that he was going to tell her off again, saying something like, Ladders are made to be climbed. And then they heard Eric himself, shouting that he was tired of repeating that the ladder was made to be climbed and ordered them to come down immediately. The girls abruptly did as he said and almost knocked him down. But Veronica explained that he had said so. So what was he afraid of now? Eric replied that anyone would have been shocked if she had jumped out at him like that. He was angry because he thought she had done it on purpose. But when he got closer and saw that she was with Arya, he asked her how she could jump off the tower with that fragile skull and said that she was crazy. But Veronica grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and said that she hoped he wasn't talking about their misses by the turtle. Eric asked what was wrong with calling her a skeleton and reminded her that he was an earl. Arya then asked him to let her go and she agreed, but outside the balcony. Finally, when Arya persuaded her to take him inside, she let him go. But before she did, he managed to tell her that she was strong but useless. Suddenly, however, the girl caught up with him and told him that she had prepared a gift for him. Eric asked what the elixir was for and whether it was related to the experiment she was conducting. 
She replied that he could ask his grandfather for details. She also asked if he felt guilty about it. Arya reminded him what she had said when she fainted, that it was not his fault, but she had heard him think about it and still blame himself. The girl said that maybe he didn't hate her that much, but Eric said that this was not possible. He really disliked her and was annoyed by her. Hearing this, Veronica could not stand it and grabbed him again, telling him to be careful what he said. Eric wondered what was wrong. He hadn't called her a turtle again. Finally, the future lord noticed that they were both annoying him and ordered them to leave. Veronica shamed him for not even saying thank you, so she told him that he was not worthy of her gift. However, she thought that the boy was really very kind and easy to read. After a while, Arya gave gifts to her aunt and uncle. They couldn't believe that it could really cure the infection and asked if it worked on something other than plants. Arya answered that yes, it does on all living things. It only doesn't work on inanimate objects. The aunt was impressed by such an expensive item and asked if the elixir could be used to clean contaminated areas. That is, she meant whether they would be able to restore the land after the maze was closed. Ernest reminded his wife that, unfortunately, it cannot be used on inanimate things, so there is no point in using it on the ground. But Selly remembered the saying that plants can only grow when the ground is alive. She added that living soil and dead soil are completely different things, but Ernest could not imagine living soil. He asked if she meant the bugs that live in it. Selly asked the girl if the elixir would work on the soil. She said she didn't know, but she thought it was worth a try to see if it would work. The truth was that it would work. But since it was the first time the girl had made it, they might think it strange if she was too sure of its properties, so they should just go ahead. The Marquis held the bottle up to the sunlight and said that they would have to use it and see. If it was really effective in cleaning up contaminated areas, then they could think about mass production. He asked the girl if she could make a lot of the elixir at once. She replied that it was not that difficult, but even if it had a cleansing effect on the earth, she would like to keep it a secret for now. The girl explained that if something went wrong, their relationship with the citizens could be damaged. The aunt then asked how she planned to release the elixir. Arya said that first, they want to sell it on the black market as an anonymous seller. Then, when word got out and everyone knew it existed, they would donate it to the public officially. Meanwhile, a bird flew in through the window and brought him a letter. From what was written, he realized what it was about. His daughter wondered how they were going to give the recipe to the church when the rumors were already spreading. Rebecca Garcia, the head of the Garcia family, said it was quite intriguing. The Garcia family is a family whose direct descendants and territories almost disappeared after the appearance of the Great Labyrinth. The lineage, which had been in difficulty, was recognized as upper class thanks to her, the second child of Solana Garcia. Having inherited the position of head of the family instead of her father, who was not interested in money or business, Rebecca became the current head of the family in real life. Rebecca told the Archmage that Arya said that this recipe was Duke Elder's and she was going to donate it to the temple because she thought it was wrong to monopolize it as her father wanted. Solan was surprised that the girl didn't even want payment for it. However, if the temple tries to make a profit from it, she is going to distribute the recipe on the market herself. Rebecca asked if Arya had any intention of making the elixir after she donates the recipe to the church. He replied that no, she wanted to mass produce it after that. The woman said that if they donated the recipe to the church, it would mean that they would not only gain the trust of the church, but also honor for giving up their wealth for the sake of the world. And if they prepare in advance for mass production with the recipe, they can bring it to market faster than the temple, an item that is difficult to obtain even on the black market. A miraculous elixir recognized even by the temple. If they put it on the market, it will sell like hotcakes. Rebecca thought that with this donation, they could announce that Ariadne was the creator of the elixir. If they had the recipe and the church had it, it would cut them off from the competition. The moderate price would create a huge fortune. Then Rebecca asked her father how old the girl was. He wondered how she could not know how old her niece was. She snapped the finger of one hand and called to Fortin to tell her. And he reported that the girl had turned eight this year. When she heard this, she became agitated and declared that she wanted to raise her and that she should be her heir. The father asked her how she could talk about such things. This child is the heir to the Duke of Elder. So the daughter said that she really could not say anything to counter this. Perhaps there was nothing she could do about it, but she could not refuse to sell the elixir. The Archmage emphasized that he had no right to make such decisions. He had just come to talk to her. After all, Arya had asked him to recommend someone to sell it through. It was up to Ariadne from there. Rebecca smiled and asked if it was really necessary to let the child decide for himself. It was his and her brother's responsibility to look after her at that age. The father replied that of course they would if Arya were a normal child. 
but she poured the contaminated water on her hand to show them the effect of the elixir. Since she had offered them a deal to hand him over in exchange for her protection, they had decided to respect her decision. Rebecca emphasized that she seemed to be Gloria's daughter. Her determination and focus is just like her mother's when she ran away from home to become a duchess when she came of age. And she added that the way she tries to escape from her father's clinging hands or tests, the elixir on her body is similar to her mother. But she hopes that the girl's taste in men will be better. She also said that, come to think of it, the truth is that before she left, Gloria contacted her once. A short note with the place and time of the meeting. She said that she did not want anyone else to know about it and asked to keep it a secret. The archmage asked what had happened, and the daughter replied that they had not met. Her sweet little sister had not come. She waited for her all day at the appointed place, but she never showed up. Later, during the investigation, she found out that she had died in an accident. The archmage asked her why she was telling him this only now. She replied that it was suspicious. So she tried to do some digging to find something, but it was to no avail. No matter how hard she searched for the truth, it all came down to an accident. She wondered what secret her sister was trying to tell her. But now that she had told her about the baby, she seemed to understand. With Gloria's character, she would never have put up with her husband's violence. She would have divorced him as soon as she discovered it. But the princess is different. The father tried to force her to give up the child until she ran away. At the same time, there were rumors that Duke Elder was a ladies' man. After they were married, he seemed to have become sensible, but it was hard to believe. The archmage was upset because he realized that it was his fault that things had happened the way they had. Rebecca said that she knew he would blame himself, so she hadn't told him about the letter before, but her father thanked her for sharing it with him. His daughter invited him to meet Arya, but he said he wasn't going to come back for a while, even though his daughter thought his work in the capital was over. Then she picked up the document and asked if it was because of him. It was the custody certificate for Ariadne. The Duke may not confess to torturing the princess. No matter what evidence is presented in court, according to royal law, if the biological father denies it, it will be very difficult to win. And then the archmage confessed that he had stolen him from the duke. It was not such a big deal. He persuaded the king to teach the royal wizards for a while in exchange. Rebecca remarked that it seems Duke Elder is really incompetent. She hadn't known her father would struggle to use his connections in this way, but he did not expect himself to engage in fraud. At the same time, the daughter thought that this reason was even stranger. If the duke was incompetent, then why couldn't she find any evidence that he had killed Gloria? If her death really wasn't an accident, what if he used this elixir that didn't exist before for others? This is probably why Ariadne wants to give it to the temple. If the existence of the elixir is known, they might be able to find proof. Rebecca told her father that she had prepared a guest room for him, so she invited him to stay the night. When he asked her where she was going, she told him she was going to see the Weaver family. She needed to meet her smart niece as soon as possible. She realized that a child under 10 years old could never have thought of such a plan so far in advance. She wondered who she was if she had planned it so carefully. But when she arrived at the castle, she was surprised to hear that the whole family had not gone to train or to conquer something, but they had gone to have a picnic, and even Eric. Rebecca was surprised that her brother Ernest and his wife went on a picnic, and even Eric went too. She wondered what kind of wind was blowing. She looked at the family and could not believe that her brother could smile so silly, and even his wife, wearing a wreath, was the very embodiment of a stern knight, and Eric even let her wear it. Suddenly, Veronica stood in her way, and the woman explained that she was not the enemy, and everything was fine. The couple also noticed her and called her over. The Marquis said he had heard of her arrival, but she had arrived earlier than he expected. Her nephew also greeted her. Rebecca noticed that he had grown up while she had been away. She also noticed that the wreath looked good on him. She then approached the girl herself, saying that she must be her niece. Arya greeted her and said her name. The woman approached the girl and tried to touch her cheeks, but the Marquis quickly took her away from Rebecca. However, she explained that she was just checking to see if she was alive. Veronica confirmed that she wanted to do the same when she first saw her. But Ernest emphasized to both of them that the baby's body was fragile, so they could not just touch her. And he started shouting that next time they should wash their hands before coming over. Rebecca was surprised by the man's behavior, but she explained that she had come to talk to her niece. She asked the girl if she could spare some time for her. So they met in a separate room, and Rebecca told her that she had heard her story from her father. And before they started, she asked if she wanted to talk to her as her aunt or as the head of the Garcia family. But Aria was a little confused. She didn't remember the original story mentioning the name Rebecca Garcia. It only said that the head of the Garcia family was Eric's aunt. She realized that it was her mom's sister, so it must be okay. Grandpa chose her because he trusted her and introduced her to the girl as planned. But the problem was that since she was mentioned only briefly in the story, Aria knew almost nothing about her. 
so she realized that she might have to come face to face with her herself. So she asked her what was the difference between Garcia's head and her aunt's. But Rebecca answered the question with a question, and that was whether there was a difference between a polite lie and a kind lie. The girl asked if there was any difference if they were both lies. She replied that if the merchant did not lie at all, it meant that he was planning to betray her. Aria listened attentively, but still did not understand. The aunt then added that if she didn't want this to happen, she should be able to discern what type of lie was being told, and that she was giving her, as her niece, several options to choose from. To make her point better, Rebecca suggested that she explain it more clearly. She told her to think about what would be most beneficial to her. Aria had been preparing for this conversation, but after exchanging only a couple of phrases, she felt as if her memory had been completely wiped clean. She hadn't realized that she would have such a hard time understanding her. She couldn't choose which lie to tell. But suddenly she wondered if she hadn't thought about it too much. Had Rebecca really brought her here to discuss something so important? After all, in her eyes, she was just an eight-year-old girl. And more importantly, Rebecca is her mom's sister. Her grandfather sent her here on purpose and called her a trustworthy person. She was worried that everything would be all right if she trusted her. So she summoned up the courage to ask her aunt if it was true that she was teasing her now. Rebecca objected and asked if the salesman was going to make a deal. Why would he tease her? She said that if she thought about it too long, she might lose everything. The girl said that she was not stupid. Then the aunt laughed because she was worried that the girl would be indifferent, but she was nicer than expected. And when she asked if she had passed her interview, Aria said that her aunt was lying so she couldn't trust her anymore. Rebecca explained that she had simply told her smart and sweet niece the truth and asked if she could see them, her honest eyes. But she said she didn't believe her. Aria said that people who say to believe just by looking into their eyes are frauds. Then her aunt asked her where she had heard it. The girl said she heard it from her mother. Rebecca tilted her head and said sadly that she knew it. When they were young, she played some pranks on Gloria and told her to look into her eyes with the phrase, trust me. And then her mom said the same thing as the girl. Finally, Rebecca brought in a big stack of papers and said it was time to show her what she had prepared for her niece. She explained that it was a contract. Everything is planned out exactly as she wanted it. It even includes how to sell it and how to distribute it. Rebecca said to write here all the ingredients needed to create the elixir, including land, buildings, and even people. Also, to study it carefully so that you can discuss all the points with your uncle and aunt and give it to them before she leaves. The last thing she said was that she was going to start a big business, and from now on, she needed a talented person to go to meetings, travel abroad, and take care of the business on her behalf. In other words, the secretary. She added that she had picked a few people, so she said to let her know if any of them liked her. Aria had no idea that she would be preparing so much. She thanked her for her help. Rebecca emphasized that if she needed anything, she should not hesitate to tell her. After all, she owned all the stores on the continent. Finally, the girl said that she had almost forgotten to ask her for something. She asked if she could find someone for her. When Rebecca asked who she had in mind, she said that he was the person she wanted to sponsor. The boy had been walking for a long time and hadn't eaten anything on Sunday. Because of the contaminated soil, there was nothing edible around. For an orphan like him, finding a job as a street boy or a delivery boy is like getting a star out of the sky. So all he could do was work as a mercenary. But when he came up and said that he wanted a job, the knight said that he had already told him to give up. No one would hire a useless beggar like him. The boy begged to be given at least a chance to show his skills. But the knight said that if he were three or four years older, he would think about it. However, he did not understand how his age affected his abilities and asked to be given the same opportunity as the others. But the knight was furious and drew his sword. He addressed him as an evil one and said that he could say with certainty that he would not stand up to even the lowest level monsters. However, he said that even if his skills were good, what was the point? Mercenaries always die first, no matter how strong they are. And if he saw his corpse, he would have nightmares because he was the one who hired him. So he ordered him to listen to him. But the boy turned the sword and changed its trajectory. He said not to be afraid of the power of the monsters. Even a racing carriage can be overturned by a simple stone. The boy grew up learning this. The knight knelt down and smiled slyly and asked who had taught him such things. He replied that his late father had taught him. At first, his house was on the edge, in the very center of the infected area. Learning to fight monsters from his adoptive father was inevitable. After his death, he wandered the infected area all alone. And by the time he was 12 years old, battling monsters became his routine. The knight listened to the boy with sadness and said that there was not a single person in this place who did not have a tragic story. So he said that if he was really confident in his skills and wanted more money, he could go to the alley and find a haberdashery there. 
and when he got there, he should say that he wanted to be a part of it. The boy listened attentively, thinking that there might be a few people there who might be interested in sponsoring a young man as energetic as he was. But when he left, the knight noticed that the annoying bastard was quite easy to fool. He hoped that he would become the plaything of some rich man and then be thrown away like garbage. The shop the knight had described was in ruins, but the entrance was brand new. When he stepped inside, the smell of cloth and leather permeated his nose. The elderly woman who was there, hearing his words, I want to be a part of it, calmly pointed to the old door. When he opened it, he found that it was not a fabric warehouse. It was a completely different world from the outside. There was a man sitting at a table who immediately told the boy not to go any further because he would dirty the floor and asked who had told him about the place. At first, the boy assumed that it was probably the owner. So he repeated that he wanted to be a part of it. The man asked if he thought he could be a part of it just because he wanted to. He asked again who told him about the place and how much he knew about it. The boy recalled what the knight had said about having a chance to be sponsored, but as expected, even here, he did not seem to be welcome. However, the man noticed the boy's red eyes, eyes that see fire, eyes that call for fire, eyes that burn, and cursed eyes. These are all nicknames that people use to call children with red eyes. Such children are born very rarely, and most of them die in their youth, but the cause of death is always the same. It is always fire. They say that fire often follows a child because fire spirits look like children with red eyes. Nevertheless, the harm caused by a child with red eyes is too great in comparison to the love the fire spirits have for them. Therefore, people have begun to dislike such children. And then the boy realized that maybe that was why his biological parents had abandoned him. That was why he had never asked his adoptive father about them. A young man was curious to meet someone who liked his red eyes. He asked the man if he was afraid of them. But the man said that he would not be here if he was afraid of such things. On the contrary, he would like to invite him to become part of their association. And he asked if he knew the story about the fire spirits who like red-eyed children. This means he has a good chance of becoming a knight of the elements or a warrior. It would take a lot of effort and time to grow up, but he emphasized that he believed in his potential and would sponsor him. The boy just listened and remained silent. Since his father died, he was the first person to pat him on the head. And it was the first time he had seen someone who was happy to see his eyes. The man asked what about it, if he would be a part of it and grow into a wonderful young man. If he wanted to, he could just leave. But the boy did not want to hide anymore because of his red eyes. Maybe this time it would work out, so he said he would do it. The man was pleased. A boy with red eyes is really lucky, so he offered to make a contract. However, he was hesitant about whether he should make a quick buck and throw it away or keep it alive longer to use as a cash cow. He watched the boy sign the document and remarked that he could spend his time figuring out how to make the best use of it. Because from now on, he would be his pawn. Finally, at the end, the man congratulated Axel Valentine on joining the Chess Association. The Chess Association is a place where masters take potential talents under their care and become their patrons. Pawns fulfill any requests that come there. From the outside, it looks like a training center for talented artisans. But in reality, it is a gambling house for the nobility, run by slave traders. Many were killed or became slaves. If a slave refuses to work or wants to leave the association, the master will demand compensation for everything that was spent to sponsor the pawn. Those who cannot pay are left with huge debts and are sold elsewhere as slaves. In the original story, the main character, Axel Valentine, was a chess pawn who stayed in the organization for a very long time. Robert Blake is Axel's master, a man who is ready to do anything to make money, even to adjust the results of bets. Despite the fact that the boy knew that the only reason he chose him was because of his red eyes, he considered him his second father and did everything he said. But in exchange for his loyalty, he received a cruel betrayal. Axel managed to survive and escape. In the novel, which described his life, the boy vowed to become stronger in order to take revenge on the association and kill Robert. Arya wanted to help him. The best way would be to redeem him from there, but she was afraid that this would make him weaker than in the story. This world will be doomed. Everyone, including her, will die. So in order for the protagonist to save the world, she has to do something, no matter what. She has to stop the protagonist from getting the regression ability. The moment the protagonist first uses his regression begins a sad ending that turns out to be a trap. In the short story, Axel did not know the consequences of his return, and this led to a bad ending. But with her participation, perhaps everything can be fixed. Arya believed that if stopping his returns could lead to saving the world, then the main character would still need to become the strongest. Suddenly, someone knocked. Simon Dent, whom Rebecca had helped to get the job as Arya's secretary, entered the room. He said that he had fulfilled all the girl's orders. The resume that Auntie had prepared for each man had a list of qualities that made him trustworthy, 
but Simon Dent's was only that he was devoted to money. So as long as he was paid properly, he would not betray. The aunt has invested a large sum, but once the business is up and running, the profits will be huge. He is the perfect secretary for her. The girl noticed that he came back quickly. Simon explained that she had promised him a bonus if he finished faster, and Arya handed him the money. However, the secretary said that she would accept it after she checked his work. Arya knew that he was devoted to money, but he also had a really good work ethic. She was wondering how to make the main character strong, but in a less dangerous way. She decided that she needed to steal the role of Robert Blake, the owner of the Chess Association. Axel trusted him and was loyal, so he played a crucial role in helping him become strong. So for Axel's sake, she decided to ask Simon to persuade Robert to sell her the entire chess association. The result would be that she would have all his slaves and estate at her disposal. In addition, as she had expected, Axel's resume was also in the documents. Then she would create a good environment for him and provide him with useful artifacts and then hand over all the difficult tasks of the novel to him. The girl realized that Axel would only truly unleash his power after betrayal, so it was no different than cheating, but she had no choice. It was the best way to avoid him using his power. So she praised Simon for his excellent work and told him that she expected him to become the manager of the chess association. All he would have to do was follow her orders. In addition, she added that there would be separate rewards for being manager and secretary. So Simon said he would do his best. Arya explained that the terms of the contract would remain the same as they were. As her secretary and as her manager, he is the person who has absolutely nothing to do with her. She asked if he could do it. He of course agreed. He said he would do everything in the best possible way. No one would ever suspect that his mistress was an eight-year-old princess. Finally, the girl asked if the elixirs were ready for the black market. Simon replied that they were, and that the first batch would be on sale tomorrow. He said that he had already finished covering his tracks. Whoever traces the source of the elixir will be led to Elder's Castle. For Arya, this was wonderful. The Duke will take the blame for the elixir getting on the black market, and then they would donate the Duke's recipe to the church. The girl was happy because it would be hard to believe that an eight-year-old princess had planned all this. A little later, Arya asked how the preparations for mass production were going. Simon replied that the ingredients, supplies, and locations had been determined, but asked if they were planning to use slaves. Using them would be cheaper than hiring people, and there would be less chance of the recipe leaking. But Arya, although she knew that slavery was legal in the world, found it hard to use them because of the memories of her past life. So she told Simon that instead of using slaves, they would turn it into a job. Weaver's land is poor and also prone to cold, so it is not suitable for agriculture. If you can't hunt or fight, there's not much you can do. But if you build a factory and hire workers, then they can use their wages to sharpen their relations with their competitors. Simon then asked if that was the reason why the factory had to be on Weaver's land, which was close by. Arya replied that no, it was because it was her mother's house and she wanted to pay them back somehow. The secretary was surprised. When he first came here, he thought that Chairman Garcia was joking with him. But now, every time he sees her with such wisdom and intelligence, he begins to doubt his mistress's age. Simon thought that as long as he was paid, it was enough and was really surprised. However, he told the girl that he understood. Meanwhile, at Blake's mansion in Crime City, Axel couldn't believe that this could be happening and they had a new master. But the knight said that it was true and that Blake was his third master. The young man wondered how his master had changed before he had even received his first task. Perhaps he had lied when he said he saw his potential. The knight gave him a book and said that in any case, his new master had ordered him to give it to him and he should read it before his first task. Axel heard about the first task and could not believe that he would be given it. He wondered what it would be. The knight replied that it had not yet been decided, but it was quite obvious what kind of mission he would be given. But when the young man asked him to tell him about it, he said that he would know when the time came. However, it looked as if he had no intention of telling him at all. The boy was confused and asked when the new owner was coming, but he was told that he was not coming. There was only a new manager, and he had left. Axel started shouting what he was talking about, and the knight replied that it seemed they were just going to give orders through the manager, and whatever else he wanted to ask him. He said that he didn't know anything else, and since the task he had been given had been completed, he had to leave. Axel was angry because he did not know that the master would change as soon as he entered and he did not understand what they meant when they gave him this book instead of the task. The red-eyed boy is the same book about a red-eyed boy that his father bought for him, the boy who was always starting fires where he lived. And in the end, he burned down his village and was forced to wander alone. One day, someone asked the sad boy if he had ever looked into his own eyes. The center is yellow, and toward the outer edge of the pupil, it becomes redder. His eyes are like red flames. 
It was horrible, but it explained why spirits born of fire were drawn to him. He was reading this book. His father had bought it for him and just put it on the bookshelf, but he did not understand why the owner wanted him to read it. Suddenly, a man called out to him. He explained that from now on, he would be his teacher. The boy did not like this, so he asked on whose authority he would teach him. He replied that it was the wish of his sponsor, Adrian Black, who had hired him. Axel thought about it. Could this really be the name of his new master? After all, Black sounded like a nickname, not a family name. However, the teacher did not hesitate and told him to follow him. He added that he would have to learn a lot about history, geography, mathematics, the theory of magic, and the science of monsters. But Axel did not understand why he should learn geography and math. But the teacher did not know either, for he was only an employee, so he had to walk obediently behind him. He could not have imagined that he would be taught the subjects taught to aristocrats. It would have been better if he had practiced fencing instead. The whole situation seemed strange. He could not explain to himself what the hell this new master wanted from him. Fire spirits are usually born of the earth and the sun, but occasionally they are born in a great fire or volcano. The spirits so born, unlike those born of earth and sun, are weak and die soon after the fire is extinguished. One day, however, a fire elemental began to go around supporting these lower spirits. And then hundreds of fire spirits followed him. The fire began to spread wherever they went, like a real disaster. Out of fear, the people called it the Flaming Sword. Axel listened carefully to the name of the chief leader, Akmang. The term Flaming Sword came from this creature, which is known as an elemental animal in the form of a flaming wolf with a golden horn. The teacher explained that perhaps because he was born of the earth and the sun, he never died. All the men who had tried to tame the animal had been roasted to a crisp. So he told him that if he ever came across a flaming sword, he should run as fast as he could. But on second thought, he probably wouldn't be able to run away. When Axel asked why, he said that they are also fire spirits. They would like his eyes and come after him. The lesson was suddenly interrupted by the secretary. He apologized for stopping them in the middle of the lesson, but it was an emergency, so he asked for understanding and gave the boy his first assignment. Axel opened a letter that said to collect a seven-colored crystal from a crystal oasis in a large desert. The signature was Adrian Black. The boy wondered what kind of strange man this master was, who had given him his first task but never showed his face. Although he noticed that the objects sent to him with the task were of excellent quality. In fact, they are all luxury items. He would not have known about it if Bishop had not tried to beg him for them, and the boy had never even seen the master who had given him all this. The Great Desert, the Crystal Oasis, the Seven Colored Crystal. He learned about all this in the classroom. And this knowledge he received from his teacher was quite useful, especially now. He learned how to navigate the map correctly so as not to get lost. With his speed, Axel thought he could do the task very easily. But he did not understand why he was given a letter to open if he was in danger. Everywhere he looked, there was nothing dangerous. A minute later, however, he heard the sound of fire. He turned around and could not believe his eyes. There was a flaming sword in front of him. The boy was confused and did not know what to do. He had not expected the flaming sword to appear here. Besides, they were all too fast, so they could easily catch up with him. Finally, he climbed up the mountain, but he had nowhere else to go. All the fire spirits were looking at him, and then he realized that it must be his eyes that were causing it. Meanwhile, Arya was thinking that by now, Axel should have already left for his first mission. In the original story, he had already had other assignments. The reason she didn't give it to him at the same time is that all of his first few tasks were pointless. In the book, the members of the chess association locked Axel up and made a bet whether there would be a fire because of his red eyes. And if it did, they also bet whether he would survive or die. His master Robert thought only of making more money and told the young man that this was his job. But one day he began to use the boy for a variety of tasks. Fear is an important incident that the protagonist must experience. Arya didn't worry about his sword skills. His adoptive father was a captain of the Imperial Guard in the Empire of Crete. Besides, he received basic knowledge from his teacher, but then Axel was the only survivor of the fear fire. At the same time, the young man was in hell. He had the impression that he was trapped. It was hard to breathe, and he was worried that he might die like that. Axel remembered everything he had been told about his eyes and wondered if he should tear them out so that they would stop haunting him, and he was about to tear at least one out. But then he remembered the letter. Why the red-eyed boy was the only one to survive. People with red eyes usually die the fastest, but they do not die from being burned alive. In the fairy tale, the child was in about seven fires. During the last one, the villagers tied the boy to a post. Then there was a fire that burned the whole village to ashes. There was only one survivor left. The red-eyed boy was the only one who survived the fire. 
Axel realized that it was just a fairy tale, so the story could be made up. But if the boy hadn't been burned alive then, and it seemed to him to become clear, the only way for the red-eyed boy to die was either by lack of oxygen or by someone who would crush him with debris. He realized that he would not die by fire, and the letter from his master was the key to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. The last words in the letter were, follow the main thing. So his goal was to get to the boss. Axel wanted to use his father's gift, but the sword started to melt because it was hot as hell. But he could not just give up. He had to put out this fire. And then he remembered a conversation with his father. When he was little, he had asked his father what he had to do to become a knight of the elements. He replied that he had to make a contract with the spirit of an animal. And when he asked how to tame it, he replied that it would be difficult for him to understand it now if he tried to explain it. But first, he had to get the spirit's approval. Axel must combine agility, skills, and weapons. And the easiest way is to climb up and hold on to it until the animal gets tired and gives up. Then the boy climbed on its back, but there was no reaction. At first, he thought that he had tamed it, but if he had, the fire would have disappeared. But he had to make it recognize Axel. However, the animal was very strong. It was stronger than a wild horse, but he was not going to give up. He was sure he would not die here, for he had to fulfill his father's dying wish. Meanwhile, the girl arrived at her grandfather's house. But as she sat in the carriage, she still thought about Axel. She wondered if he was doing a good job, but the archmage was offended. He thought she had come to see him, but it seemed she had other motives. The girl reassured him that she also wanted to see him, but it was just on the way. Then he said that it didn't seem like she was really into sponsoring for Axel if she wasn't even going to meet him in person. However, the girl apologized for making him worry. Grandpa and Rebecca know that she is sponsoring Axel. The reason she told them was that after looking at her father's lab records, she became curious about his red eyes. She felt that she was cheating by using the information from the story, but she really wanted to help the main character, but she couldn't tell them. After a while, they arrived just in time to the West Tower, which is next to a large temple where her grandfather needs to finish a new job. And she came to see the end of Axel's task in person. The Archmage reassured the girl that he was only collecting seven colored crystals, so she should not worry too much because the people who live here do it to earn a living. However, Arya replied that this was her first task as a child, and she thought that it was time for the flame to come to the great temple as well. The grandfather hugged the girl and said that he always forgot that she was much younger than the boy. Suddenly, Solanus was called, for his class was about to begin. So he said goodbye to his granddaughter and told her to come back before the sun went down. The girl waved at him, but she was still a little worried. She knew that the main character would not die, but she thought he must be scared. Ever since she became involved in the story, she had been asking herself, what if the plot changed? She really tried to make the situations as similar as possible, but there are still many differences. The biggest of these was the letter she had prepared herself for the young man to open when he was in danger. Its contents are meant to be the trigger for the mental struggle Axel experienced in the original story and which he needs in order to survive. A truth that he could only know by sacrificing his eye. Arya thought that if she tried to tell him directly, it might hinder his development but she didn't want him to lose his eye, so she wrote the letter. She was worried that the boy had taken the hint she had left and hoped that he would be able to tame the elemental. However, she was afraid that in the end, the boy would use the eye to tame Akmung. Even though the protagonist of the novel, Axel, is still just a 12-year-old child, he should not have been hurt as badly as in the novel and come back unharmed. Finally, she heard unusual sounds and saw Akmung, the horse Axel Valentine, was riding. So everything worked out. The girl told Simon that Axel had returned and ordered him to greet him and check on his condition and then report back to her. Veronica asked if the girl would go outside, as she had been waiting for it for a long time. However, Arya realized that she should not be here right now. She said that she had told her that she did not plan to meet him in person and that she should not go outside either. The secretary watched what was happening and was shocked, even though Arya had told him about it beforehand. No one could believe that he had actually managed to tame Akmung, but it seemed that he had broken his leg so they offered him help, but he refused. Axel demanded to see his master. He exclaimed that he knew that Adrian was there and knew everything, so he must come out. The father's sword melted so easily, but the clothes given by the master were not even damaged. To top it all off, the letter contained detailed instructions on how to tame the animal. He realized that he had sent it knowing that he would encounter it. So he shouted that the master was afraid of an ordinary slave. Veronica remarked that he was being too insolent to the lady who sponsored him. But the girl told her to calm down. Arya explained that his anger was justified even though she was sponsoring him. And even if she had prepared him to do it, it was true that she had deliberately made him meet Akmong. Finally, exhausted, Axel fainted. The girl saw this but did not come out. There was one thing she was grateful for. This time, Axel did not lose his eye. 
Later, Simon told the girl that the boy's leg was broken and he was dehydrated, but there would be no consequences. Arya breathed a sigh of relief when the secretary added that he had a strong body and, since he had managed to tame the elemental, his regeneration should be even faster. Then the girl ordered that the boy be given a room to heal in when they returned to the castle and that he should stay by his side and that if anything happened, he should report to her immediately. She also added that if Axel recovered without any problems, she would reward him. So he promised to do his best. But the secretary could not stand it and asked how the boy had managed to tame the animal when he was only 12 years old. Surely after that, everyone would start watching him. But Arya wasn't worried. She assured the secretary that they wouldn't know he was here. She explained that the necklace he was wearing belonged to the Chess Association. He has the opportunity to credit the pawn assignment. If the Chess Association sees today's recording, they will stop the rumors. He is a pawn, and if they wait, he will most likely become a slave. And they would never miss an opportunity to enslave a knight of the elements. Arya said that even if she took off his necklace, the association would never let him go. Simon then asked if there was any point in training him. The girl replied that it did. Axel has just started to take his first steps. The work he has to do and the things he has to experience are piling up like a mountain. The only thing she can do for him is to take some of the work away. But she is not sure if it really makes any sense. But she can't just sit there and do nothing. Four years have passed unnoticed. Arya is still the owner of the Adrian Black Chess Association. She has reached her 12th birthday while watching the protagonist's life. Suddenly, Lucy came into her office, knocking, and said that Eric was waiting for her in the garden. Everyone around them discussed that the number of casualties and expeditions had decreased again and that contaminated areas were being cleaned up faster. The areas with filth are still growing, but there is a chance that such areas will disappear altogether because now there is an elixir. Many things have changed in the meantime. First, the elixir magic potion is complete. When it appeared on the black market, many people thought it was just a rumor. Until now, they have always been lies, but a few people still managed to get it. They shouted that it was a cure, and it worked. Soon, people realized that the elixir really did work. Everyone started looking for it, and the demand went up sharply. The price went up again. As the demand grew, so did the price. The demand got to the point where the elixir became rare again, so that even the temple and the royal family had to search diligently for the magic medicine. There was not a single soul who did not know of the existence of the elixir. The archmage and Arya visited the temple. On that day, they did not donate food or money to the temple, but gave them the recipe for the elixir, the magic potion. The temple appreciated this donation and rewarded them by giving them the title of saint. After the recipe was revealed, Weaver's factory went to work and the temple began to sell the elixirs it produced. Gradually, its name, the magic potion, spread throughout the world. Many things also happened to the girl. First, her body is healthier and she no longer has nosebleeds or fainting spells. Her brother Eric is now 20 years old and has fully entered adulthood. However, he still calls her Turtle and she calls him Sardine. When the girl asks him where her silly brother went, he says that it was many years ago. He died and is no longer here. Arya smilingly said that it must be the end of the world and there is a corpse walking around. But Eric replied that someone seemed to be talking too much. Suddenly, he picked up a letter from the table and showed it to the girl, emphasizing that the bastard had the nerve to send another letter. The girl asked if it was a letter from the Duke. After the recipe for the elixir was donated to the church, the Duke went half mad. Then, unable to suppress the rumors that he had been abusing his daughter, he lost custody of her. This is how the Duke's reputation completely collapsed. Soon after the elixir began to be sold, he began to send letters. Sometimes he showed favor in them, sometimes he criticized them, and also claimed that he should have a share of the profits from it. Arya asked her brother if he had come here to give her a letter. He replied that he was worried that her weak skull would faint, so he suggested that they read it together. Eric was worried that she would be hurt when she read the contents. The biggest change in the girl's life that had happened to her was that she had become completely accustomed to being around the Weaver family and had received their kindness and sincerity. She realized the clear difference between them and the Duke. Arya began to trust them and was no longer afraid of such letters. When she had read all the pages, she wondered what nonsense he had written again, but there was something between the pages. It was an invitation to the wedding of Franz Elder and Leda Piccolo. But the Duke's remarriage was not mentioned in the original story. The letter said that after many difficult years, after the loss of his wife and daughter, her father had met a woman with whom he had fallen in love. And they hoped that Arya will come to their wedding and complete their family. Sincerely, Franz Elder and Leda Piccolo. But Leda Piccolo was not mentioned in the novel either. The girl assumed that he was trying to make another heir to replace her. In the original story, he brought a thief into the house and tried to conceive an heir with her. 
but that is only possible if she is not here. And even if they had another child, like the eldest daughter, she would still have more rights. If that's the case, then he's probably planning to kill her. Eric said that it didn't seem right to him, but he asked the girl if she would go to the wedding. She said she didn't want to. It was obvious that he was up to no good. Her brother patted her head and remarked that, as expected, their skull was as smart as ever. But Arya insisted that he not touch her hair because it would ruin her hair. Eric said he wouldn't ruin it, he would fix it. The girl didn't like it and was offended that he could have left it alone in the first place. If she is so beautiful that he wants to pat her on the head, he can show his affection with pocket money instead of messing up her hair. Eric laughed until he cried and reminded her that she was the one who had the most money, but still kept asking for pocket money. She pointed out that there was a difference between just money and her pocket money. Then Eric gave her a token of his affection because she was very nice. He looked at her and realized that she was trying not to show it, but she was happy to receive every sign of affection. She was not happy because she had received money, but because she had received a gift from her family. Eric realized that if he could, he would give her money for pocket money every day. It would be wonderful if Arya was always happy. Later, when the evening came, she gathered up a plate of cookies, and before going to bed, she wanted to ask Ree something. When she saw her, she was very happy to see her. But Arya needed to know about a character who had never been mentioned in the story, Leda Piccolo. As Ree ate the treats the girl had prepared for her, Arya noticed that as she grew up, she had remained the same. The only difference was that she was able to speak better in sentences and could change into whatever clothes the girl brought her. As time went on, she continued to stay in the child's body. When Ree saw that Arya was looking for something, she asked her what she wanted to find. And she said she wanted to know about the appearance of this Leda Piccolo. But the spirit was surprised to hear about this woman. She said that there was no connection. This name was not mentioned in the original story. Yet, Arya thought so. Re remembered the original story much better than she did, and if that was the case, then Leda Piccolo really didn't appear there. Then the girl asked what about the other world, if she had ever seen such a name there. Rai replied that not in the past and present, for sure, and she was not sure about the future. There are few books she has not read them all. Spirit was upset that she could not find information about the death of Gloria Elder, and felt sorry for the girl. They had found information about Veronica so easily, and thought it would be so easy with her mother but it had been four years since she had asked her for it. No mention of her death was found. The Divine Library cannot do everything either. Arya calmed the spirit down and told it that everything was fine and not to worry. Perhaps this information does not exist at all, if she couldn't find it. Then the girl asked her to find something about Leda Piccolo, and she immediately dropped everything and ran off to find it, saying she would be back soon. Since Rhi has been reading a lot of books, she answers faster, and her vocabulary has increased. General information, geography, records of maze survival, artifact use, families and groups, and so on. Thanks to this information that Rhea found, she was able to plan the development of the main character. When Axel tamed Akmong, the association began to overwhelm him with tasks. It is an underground market where the rich hand out tasks and orders to kill or torture innocent people, from humiliating betting assignments to tasks involving betrayal and destruction of the organization. Such a huge negative influence that could hinder Axel's development she needed to either decisively change or completely eradicate. Her plan was to keep the important missions that had the most impact on its development. And the mission she chose always forced him to challenge himself in an extreme situation. She had no choice. It was necessary for his development. But the girl could not stop worrying that she might have spoiled the protagonist's path. This concern clashes with her disappointment that she could not find a better way. So I am grateful that it develops at the same speed as in the novel. But the Chess Association has a system of promotion through competition, and the main character was promoted as the youngest knight. As in the book, he is expected to take part in a competition where he will be betrayed as before, and this will lead to the Chess Association expelling him. This day will be her last day as Adrian Black. Arya realized that this is a necessary future for the full development of the protagonist. Until then, she had to give it her all. Several days have passed since then. As planned, the Duke held his modest wedding. Of course, the girl was not there. The nobles gossiped, knowing that the duke had lost custody of her. Duke Elder sent another letter asking for an explanation, but there was no further action from him. The duke's remarriage, which was not mentioned in the novel, seemed to be slowly fading into the background until something happened. The duke's wife, Elder, arrived at Weaver Castle in a hurry, and the Marquis was informed by the butler. Ernest noticed that she had arrived at a busy time. It was just before the last winter expedition, and he asked if he was sure that it was the Duke's wife. He replied that the knight who delivered Lady Arya's wedding gift had seen her at Elder Castle. The identity of Leda Piccolo was confirmed. However, 
He noted that her condition seemed strange. She had brought almost none of her clothes with her and was dressed completely out of place for the weather. She had arrived on a food delivery cart. In addition, there were traces of blood on the bandage on her right arm. Ernest immediately remembered that Arya had been injured in the same place. The butler asked what he should do, since the Marquis had previously ordered him to refuse any visits from the Duke. Finally, after thinking about what to do, Ernest said that they could not send a sick person out in winter and ordered him to be taken inside. And Leda Piccolo began to tell him that she loved Franz with all her heart. She had heard rumors that he had been abusive to his daughter and had been deprived of custody because of it. But she was deceived by his sad expression. He said that he was falsely accused. So her heart melted and she believed him. But she quickly realized that it was a lie. The Duke said it was nothing to worry about and would stop as soon as she asked him to. Having experienced excruciating and unbearable pain only once, she told him that she did not want to do it again. But he got a rather frightening look on his face. She sobbed and felt sorry for him because she had only realized what she had experienced. Looking at her confession, the Marcus ordered the doctor to examine her arm, and it turned out that it was just as injured as Aria's. The Marquis had his suspicions, but he could not believe that her arm was really injured. He was shocked that Franz, that bastard, was still conducting the same experiments as he had done on his daughter. Leda Piccolo did not appear in the original story. According to the information Ree gave her, records of the Piccolo family were found in the Labyrinth Almanac of the Kingdom of Abusal. The lands of Baron Piccolo were on the border of the lands of the Duchy of Elder. They could not afford to pay the construction and maintenance costs required for a defensive magic circle. Magic circles were established by noble families in their territories to prevent mazes from appearing. But not only is this protective magic difficult to establish, but the circle did not always work as intended. Because they were unable to sustain it, half of Baron Piccolo's territories were lost to the filth caused by the appearance of the horse's grave labyrinth. At that time, the Duchy of Elder took in Baron Piccolo and his people who had lost their homes. And this was the moment when his daughter Leda first met Franz Elder. After five years of courtship, they were married. That was all the information Rhi had found. The next day, her aunt was introducing Arya to a new guest and asked her if she remembered what they had talked about yesterday. Before the season of cleansing began, she decided to have a tea party to introduce them to each other. She seemed reluctant to do so, as she was afraid that the girl's trauma would be exacerbated. But since Lita was here as a guest, she would have found out anyway. Sally probably thought it would be better for them to meet here. So she said hello to her stepmother. She also greeted the girl and said that the princess was very pretty as a doll. She was sad and wondered how Franz could do such a thing because Arya was so small. Her eyes filled with tears. She said that she was sorry because she thought that the stories about his abuse of the girl were lies. The girl realized that Leda was more vulnerable and tearful than she had thought. After all, she was only 24 or 25 now. She was angry that Franz had seduced such a young woman. She wondered if she was as deceived as her mother. According to her, the experiments that the Duke performed on her were the same as those he performed on her. Only now he used a drug. No matter how incompetent Franz was, if you have both your previous and new wife dead, rumors are bound to be created. He would at least have calculated that. The Weaver factory already has a monopoly on the elixir market. Therefore, the Duke must know that he will make little profit if he enters the business late. Doesn't this mean that he has started making another potion? While Lita remained in the castle under the doctor's care, the time came for the knights to march. Fifteen years have passed since the Great Labyrinth appeared. Since then, the monster's activity has increased significantly. And, to make matters worse, the Cursed Land is an area that even an elixir cannot heal. And it began to spread to the Luoma Mountains. When the people of those lands were evacuated, the land began to fill with monsters, who soon began to rise through the Luoma Mountains into the blizzard-prone Milo Highlands. The Weaver family is in no position to miss such a rapture. So, Grandfather ordered that no man from Elder who came here be allowed to enter. Everyone was worried that the Duke would want to come for his wife, so they wanted one of them to stay with her in the castle, but that was not possible. However, Eric asked to be relied upon with Veronica, so they stayed in the castle as family representatives. Ten days have passed since Weaver's nightly band set out on their journey. Suddenly, Lita called Arya Princess, but the girl pointed out that she was officially her stepmother and could not call her that. However, the woman reminded her that not so long ago she was just a baron's daughter. But the girl told her to drop the formalities and just call her Arya. So she agreed and asked if the girl could accept her gift, a pouch containing a spiritual lantern. Leda said that even though it ended that way, she still became Arya's mother. She didn't have much to do during the day, so she did it herself. Eric and Arya were very surprised that she made it herself. But the woman said that it was nothing special. She just made a knotted thread. 
And she explained that in their family, mothers always make a pattern of knots in the place where the lantern is attached by themselves. It is a kind of talisman. They hope that the child will live a long and healthy life. Leda was worried that the princess would be uncomfortable accepting it, but she assumed that the woman really thought she was her daughter. So she thanked her and said that she would take care of the lantern because it was so beautiful. Aria emphasized that she was officially her stepmother, but she did not think she could accept her as her own mother, just as she does not accept the duke as her father. However, she may be able to help her, since she herself was a victim. If they combined their testimony, they could send the duke to the scaffold. No, she didn't think they could, but because he conducted several experiments on humans, he's trash, worse than the devil himself. She thought it would be magical if she could kill him, so she must grow faster day by day and find a way to stop the duke. One night, a strange light from the window woke her up. She got up and left the room. Veronica thought that she was going to her study or to the restroom. She also wondered if it would be okay if she let her go alone, because she was old enough to feel more burdened if she followed her. But it was strange that the girl did not greet her because it was not like her. She looked now like a person who was obsessed with something and saw nothing in her way. This obsession frightened her, and she ran with all her might to call her lady back, but she did not even respond. Finally, the girl stopped near Lita, who was playing a flute. The latter said that it looked like they had an intruder, but it was too late. It turned out that Veronica realized too late that Leda Piccolo was a Trojan horse, but she could not let her take my lady away like that. Finally, Leda turned into black smoke and gradually began to disappear before the bewildered girl's eyes. Meanwhile, the girl couldn't figure out who was singing, perhaps Lucy, and why her body was so heavy. But the woman didn't like her waking up and ordered her to go back to sleep. Leda said that if her sweet princess sleeps, Everything will end quickly. Arya felt that she should not sleep now, but her eyes did not open. Suddenly, she saw Ri shaking her shoulders, calling out her name and telling her that the situation was an emergency and a crisis. But Arya didn't understand what was going on. She just remembered falling asleep on her bed. However, Ri explained that she could not wake her up and reach her consciousness. Finally, the spirit realized that she had mistakenly thought she had overslept. So, it is now trying to analyze her, and she is currently drugged into sleep the alleged combination. The main ingredients are moongrass and leaves bathed in moonlight, used to induce confusion or a good night's sleep, addictive. The sap of the night tree makes one sensitive to specific sound waves. Re added that it does not kill, but relaxes and dulls the senses. But Arya had never seen a spirit behave like a machine, so she asked if she meant that she was asleep because of the drugs. The girl listened attentively to the explanation that it was a powdered form that had probably been ingested through the respiratory tract and that the effect was quite strong. Finally, she understood. It was all because of the spiritual lantern. Yes, she had put drugs in it instead of spirit stone powder. But why did the Duke really tell her to do that? It turns out everything she said and did was a lie. Arya said that she would deal with this later, but now she clutched the lantern and asked Ri if she could sense what was happening outside, who was near or around her. But the spirit was worried because she could not tell. The girl reassured her, saying that even if she didn't tell her much, it would be okay so she asked her to try again. Re tensed up, closed her eyes, and saw a cold, dark, large woman. When Arya asked her if she had red hair, the spirit could not answer. The girl was sure that not much time had passed, because Re said she thought she had overslept. No matter how fast she moved with her, they would not be able to get out of the Weaver lands tonight. That means they won't be looking for her until morning at the latest. Eric's brother is in the castle, so if she waited, he would rescue her soon. The problem was what Lita had kidnapped her for. If she did it because of the duchy succession issue, she would kill her before anyone found them. As expected, she could not continue to sleep, so she asked Ree if her body was tied up now. She replied that it was not. The girl thought that this meant she could escape as soon as she woke up. So, probably Lita's goal was not to kill her, but Rhea still couldn't wake her up. Suddenly, something strange happened. The spirit began to scream that the girl was dying, and she began to worry. Ree shouted about the surroundings, the objects, the tools, the atmosphere, the preparation for magic. In the original story, the logical theory is the extraction of the soul. In other words, glamour. Glamis is what the Duke created in the original story to extract Arya's soul. It was an item that allowed people who had no ability to use other people's magic. And this is what the protagonist used throughout the story. In the novella, Duke Elder's source of power was the elixir, but his adopted daughter who received Glamis played an important role. She knew the source of the Duke's power and his magic, so she was absolutely loyal to him. When the elixir was taken away from him, he probably focused on developing Glamis. Therefore, he appeared much earlier than in the novel. If Lita uses Glamis, she doesn't need to tie the girl up because she will die as soon as her soul leaves her body. Ree was very worried that she was going to die. 
But Arya reassured her. She could not afford to wait for them to save her. She had to wake up right now. But how? Finally, she realized that she might be in the Divine Library, which meant that she was here because her body was asleep in reality. In this world, in order to connect with an elemental, the elemental knight opens a channel through their own souls. Through this, the elemental can communicate with the elemental knight and understand orders. She meant that isn't it like they come and go from the Divine Library. If Ri is her spirit and this is her territory, perhaps she became a knight of the elements through a channel to the Divine Library. However, Ri did not know if she was a great spirit herself. She was connected to Arya, but it was strange. An elemental knight cannot speak directly to a great spirit. The spirit also said that it was impossible to access the channel directly. Humans cannot do this. Arya confirmed that it would break the human soul. Therefore, it is either a spiritual channel that connects her to the library, or it is a very unique channel. The girl asked the spirit that if they called it a very unusual channel, then it would mean that she was simply out of her body. However, Ri did not understand anything about the soul being out of the body and possible contact. Then the girl explained that perhaps their souls were in contact with each other. She asked her to imagine that it was her soul or spirit or something like that. If her body in reality is connected with this body and something strongly affects it here, then it will affect the real body. Suddenly, she began to fall. The girl felt a strong pain in her stomach. She could not understand where the hell she was. After a while, she got up. There was no one around, and she was dizzy. It seems that the drug had not yet worn off, but thank God she was awake. It was a gamble, but it worked out. She had no wound on her stomach. It seems that the injuries sustained in the Divine Library do not affect reality. At first, she had to get out of there, but she did not know which way to go. Suddenly, she heard the sound of the wind and felt cold. The girl could not go on. No wonder she was left here unattended. If she went out in her pajamas, she would freeze to death. So Arya thought she could lie in wait and stab the woman with this. She still had the knife she had taken from the Divine Library, but she had never been taught how to use it. And she was not sure that she could kill someone by stabbing him. At first, she was afraid that she might die here, but then she pulled herself together and told herself that she should not be afraid of such minor difficulties. The protagonist walked through the contaminated area alone when she was much younger. In addition, she sent him to a fiery hell when he was the same age as her. Therefore, regardless of the fact that she uses the excuse of changing his limb, she is putting him through many trials. The girl thought that it would be shameful of her to give up now. This is nothing compared to what Axel went through. There must be a clue somewhere that could help her escape. But behind her, she heard someone asking how she managed to wake up. Arya turned and saw Leda behind her, who said she wasn't supposed to wake up for at least three days. She grabbed the girl by the arm and beat the knife out of her. Then she asked her where she got it, because she didn't remember bringing it here. In this position, Arya could not reach it. The woman just shouted that this was enough and that she should go back inside because it was too cold. It would be a waste of energy to resist. So the girl told her stepmother that she had become a completely different person. She asked her if it was a spiritual lantern in which she had mixed the drug with the spiritual stone powder. She noted that she could not hide in the room, so she used it to put her to sleep. Leda listened to the girl say that she made her sleepwalk so that she could go out on her own and told her that she was very smart. The girl asked if the Duke had made her do it. Had he really taken the Piccolo refugees hostage and ordered her to kidnap him? Leda, however, pointed out that Franz had not ordered her to do this. She was the one who ordered him to do it. She said that the girl still did not seem to understand what kind of person her father was. She asked if Arya really thinks that this handsome boy was capable of creating the elixir. Elder is richer than them, but that's about it. He doesn't know how to run the best family in the kingdom. He doesn't know much about magic, let alone herbology or alchemy. The woman remarked that that idiot Franz could not have done it. She was the one who came up with the idea and the plan, the one who received the reports on the results of their experiment and made the adjustments to the ingredients. And she added that it was all her masterpiece. The Duke's wife was the inspiration for the elixir experiment. Leda said that Franz was only needed to create the perfect lab rat for the elixir. She needed a child gifted with elementalist abilities, and she taught him how to do it. And fortunately, he managed to pull it off. His appearance and status are above average, and he is rich. Thanks to her, Arya has many blood brothers and sisters, seven or eight of them. Leda observed that every one of them was defeated and died. Everyone except her, who was the only successful one, probably because she was born of the daughter of an archmage. Arya knew that the Duke did not marry her mother for love. But it turned out that the reason he met her was to create the perfect child for his experiments. Leda threw her on the floor and noticed that the girl seemed to have a drug aversion, so she couldn't do anything about it. So she told her to just stay here and wait. 
Arya felt that her legs were tied, but she could not stay still in this position. She needed to at least find out the identity of this woman. So she shouted after her, asking if the duke had done as she said, like an obedient puppet. She wondered if he really could have calculated the wealth and honor he would have gained from the elixir. Then Arya asked him if he wanted to say that he had simply believed her claims. Besides, she wanted to know who she really was. After all, Leda Piccolo was the Baron's second daughter and only 20 years old. But she became even more angry and said that she was Leda Piccolo and the sorceress of the Black Cup. Those who are given the Black Cup are considered traitors to humanity because the demon world invades their world. They have rejected their humanity and sold their souls to the demons in exchange for power. Ordinary people never receive the Black Bowl. Only those who are useful and whose sense of humanity has been compromised are eligible to receive it. The Black Cup is most often given to wizards, but they are distinguished by the fact that those who receive it are called sorcerers. Leda said that Arya should know even their nickname. Most people don't know about it. They have knowledge from the demon world and more power than any human. But there was something the girl did not understand. She asked why the sorcerer was trying to make an elixir. However, the answer was simple. The woman explained that it was to gain more power. The hierarchy of power in the demon world is divided into three factions. Simply put, they are the mazes, the monsters, and the filth. These factions take over the world of Elysium, each in its own way. Arya didn't know that there was a hierarchy in the demon world. This was not in the novel, so the woman asked her which one she thought was the most dangerous. The girl replied that mazes and monsters were dangerous, but that filth was the only thing that could doom the world. So the answer was infection. Leda confirmed that this is true. Filth ranks so high. But that's only because people have no way to resist it. At this rate, most of the credit will be given to the filth faction. But when the girl found out that the woman belonged to the maze faction, she noticed that she was getting help from the enemy to take over. It seemed that the demon world was also at a standstill. Leda is furious. What kind of help can there be? And how can this weak world help them? It is considered just a little entertainment. The woman asked her what she thought, why she was telling her everything. She said that even if Arya buys herself some time, she will still die in the end, because it's too late to stop the spread of the elixir. It's time for the next part of the plan, and she needs a girl to cook something, and that something is glamour. The woman emphasized that the girl would just have to wait patiently now, for it would not be long. However, she could not let her emotions get the better of her. She had to stay calm to stay alive. Betrayal is everywhere. The worst enemies are always connected to demons. For the past few years, she had been living with good people, so she had forgotten all about it. Dead Half-Siblings is a true story from the world of demons. It is a world where this is just normal. She was upset that she had only realized this now. Even if that is so, the main mind behind the creation of the elixir is connected to the demon world. The duke could not have received the black cup himself. He would have taken the bait and made a deal with the sorcerer to make the elixir. In the novel, when Axel got rid of the duke, he was an ordinary man. If he had received the black cup, there would have been a moment when he would have used his demonic powers to fight back. But why then was Leda Piccolo not in the story? It cannot be that the Duke deceived the sorcerer. If this is the case, the most likely reason is that after the woman does the glamis, she will leave the Duke. The powers of elementalists are the natural enemy of defilement. If an elementalist uses the power of a great elemental and creates a territory around him, the filth cannot exist within it. Without an elementalist, it is almost impossible to fight long battles in polluted areas. This is why elementalists play an important role in suppressing mazes. Then Arya suggested that perhaps Glamis was created to stop the flow of infection, but this time it wouldn't be so simple. She decided that she would not sit back and wait to be used as an ingredient in the plan. However, she did not know what to do. Even if she could free herself from the vine, there was a snowstorm raging outside, and if she got out, it would be suicide. Still, the girl could not just wait until she was rescued.